Greetings, fellow Gothamites. Tiki here. And Blue Dragon 5. And we're back to cover episode 15 of season 3 of Fox's retelling of the Dark Knight mythology. Entitled, How the Riddler Got His Name. So join us as we venture into Batman's birthplace. And explore Gotham. Yes, yes. Dragon, do you like how I have both the Court of Owls mask and the Riddler green on? I'm doing double duty in the costume department. Ha 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 ha. Right. All right, but I'm not going to be like Tom Hardy in The Dark Knight Rises and wear a freaking mask over my face the whole time. I'm going to do this mono e mono, especially because that mask is suffocating. But how are we doing, Dragon? We had a... We had basically a nerd Super Bowl event last night on TV where we had Better Call Saul, uh, the series finale of Bates Motel, which we did a first impressions podcast of last night. And unfortunately, Dragon, sad, but the honest truth is probably like bar number three on our list of priorities was, hey, Gotham's back. Well, I don't know if that was like number three on our list of priorities. I mean, come on. Are you on. saying you were more excited about... Uh, Gotham than you were about Saul. Seriously, well, I'm just I'm I'm saying that we <laughs> I, we have this annoying break in between episodes. For Gotham. that's what I'm Those saying. That's what I'm saying. I'm I'm trying to emphasize that point, Dragon. That Gotham just kind of like they sort of just limped back in. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> like one of those. I don't think we had to deal with that. I mean, we've had breaks, but I don't think any of it's, it's going. No, to no, long. we've never had any sort of situation like this. Plus, but, they had uh, to write it into the episode too, which is just embarrassing. <laughs> All right, Dragon, yeah, it is. It is. And also, Dragon, something to bring up, a uh, really quick kind of pre ramble here. Gotham might, it's not been renewed yet. In other shows, like. Uh, All the CW shows have been renewed. Yeah, yeah. And other shows of this nature, like, uh, I believe Fox has. Uh, oh, gosh. I think their new show is Reaper, I think. I'm not sure. I. There, there's some new show they have on that's been renewed, and so I don't know, Dragon. It's not looking. It's looking like a coin toss that Gotham is going to get renewed for season four. Or not. Yeah, I, I think uh, personally, I think Gotham is going to be safe. I think they're going to be safe for at least five seasons. At least five seasons. We'll see. We'll see. But that's what I've heard, Dragon. It's on the bubble. It's on the bubble. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, all that aside, let's get right into it, Dragon. Let's talk about. How the Riddler got his name. All right, so we start with a cold open. A classic, and a, yeah. You know, a classic Riddler opening. You know, it's kind of a Riddle or Die situation with a, with, with a pattern. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so we get the first Riddle Dragon. We get Riddle number one in an episode filled with Riddles. Riddle number one is... Well, first and foremost, I mean, who yeah. he's going after here. You have a little professor kind of hold up. Oddly enough, they, they reused a couple sets in this episode. So they reused Hugo Strange set from uh, the uh, beginning of the season, where you know he's he's held up in like this <laughs> hideaway. He had like the plat, you know, the cell, with the plastic walls you can write on. Mm -hmm. That's where he's at right now. They reused the set. Okay. So, anyways, yeah, he's uh, costing Professor Dyson. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get into why he's targeting intellectuals a little bit later on, but it's. And it's like he's holding, he's holding Professor Dyson at gunpoint. It gives him a uh, gives him a riddle, which we go like, "I can fill a room or just one heart. Others may have me, but I cannot be shared." And uh, Dyson, he gets it wrong, much to Enigma's uh, scary chagrin and and this utter frustration. He loses his cool on this guy. <laughs> he just he is. Well, the first of many times Enigma loses his cool here. Do you, I, I love his uh, re his reasoning for losing his cool. The guy gives the answer of knowledge and he's just like, are you kidding me? Knowledge? You sp you're a professor. You cannot you spent a career sharing knowledge. That's part of the riddle. Are you an idiot? <laughs> so this really plays into like a, of a fun one of my one of my my hopes for Riddler in in this series has come true this episode so I was really happy with that and we we'll, we'll get there a little later but uh, this this plays into it but more uh, more so in this episode I love we have this kind of this new take on the Riddler where he just gets super infuriated if you get the riddles wrong. <laughs> Again, one of the reason why that is like wrong is love this because usually it's like the really like he's gloating he's all happy go lucky oh I'm so much smarter you're like no you idiot you're ruining my. Fun. 
<laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine the loose. Riddler trying to engage with uh, someone like, let's say, uh, Sam Loomis? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to talk to you. You're a freak. You're a weirdo. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, so again, Lewis is on the professor. He's uh, really what he's doing overall here is he's he, the reason one of the reasons he's really losing it here. Uh, really, he's just really kind of snapping at, at people when they get the answers wrong is because he's he's kind of every time he yells, I figure it's like him airing out his guilt over killing the penguin. That's why he's like so oh, he's kind of so overbearing during these riddles. That's why he still like, it hinges on him kind of proving a point here. And it's, again, it's, as we find out, it, the whole kind of crux of the episode is you know, he's just trying to kind of... He's, Riddler's processing his guilt over shooting his best friend in this episode. And that's kind of what you get... That's why he's so frustrated in these scenes. Sure, sure. With all these wrong okay. answers. And he apologizes for losing his cool. He ties the professor <laughs> up with surgical tubing. And uh, let me get real number two. I could be a member of a group. But I can never blend in. What am I? So then the professor, uh, he yet again just he, just he doesn't know. He just guesses a shadow, and then of course Nigma's <laughs> just a shadow. What are you kidding? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's been revealed uh, going into before we get the third rule. Enigma reveals it's you know he's been doing this with other the other greatest minds of Gotham, which include a. Uh, each of these, each of these great minds of Gotham have failed the test. He mentions, like you know, artists, writers, philosophers, all, all just completely disappoint him. I, I love how and, he puts it. He says they're uh, they're members of they're star of Gotham's intellectual and artistic constellation. That's just good wordplay right there. <laughs> it is. It is. So, uh, so Enigma then. Uh, so basically, Nigma has been trying to prove that Penguin's last words are wrong. That you know there is no the thing that keeps. We'll, we'll get a lot of times in this episode. Uh, there is there is no Ed Nigma without the Penguin. There is no Edward sure, Nigma sure. without the Penguin. And th those were you know uh, Penguin's last words before he was shot. Uh, before again that un impromptu season break <laughs> we just got. <laughs> hey, your favorite character that you've loved since the first episode is dead. Good night, everybody. See you in four months. <laughs> and, you know, now Enigma is without his guide. So, again, the whole episode, it's, it's Enigma processing his guilt and kind of looking towards what next, how, what happens with him now. His teacher's gone, so how is he going to, you know, his mentor is his kind of his, his, his guide in, in the world, in the violent world that is Gotham is now gone. So how is he going to? As he's going to move forward, and again, this is kind of his bizarre, twisted, grieving process, yeah, giving kind of the, <laughs> the, the, kind of the quiz show from heck to everyone. Right, so, Enigma, right. uh, so Enigma, again, he, he reemphasizes here that he knows who he is, but he is unsure of how to be him. <laughs> and we get riddle, num riddle number three. Riddle number three, let's see. Uh, there was no me without... Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. I'm just reading off the... <laughs> I'm just reading off the notes. Hold on. Okay. I feel your every move. I know your every thought. I've been with you since birth, and I'll be here when you rot. What am I? And he just, he, he doesn't know. And uh, that leads to a, uh, I, I forget exactly how the cold open goes, Dragon, but I know it ends in a very violent kind of way, if I remember correctly. Well, then. It ends with a bang, to say the least, because I love this. This is, this is what's great. The direction, this episode I thought was well, was well directed, because we have these great kind of visual things, like these little subtle things that do pay off by the end of the scene. Like, Nygma's going around, he's like tapping on like the, the flammable canisters, and like the, the, he sees the Bunsen <laughs> right, burns. Right. Either he turns the Bunsen burner Oh yeah, that's right, on. that's right. And then yeah, by I, the end of the scene... It's in a Dark night sort of way, and, you know, appropriately enough, because I kind of feel like throughout the episode, he's sort of a Joker looking for his Batman, so it kind of ends with him walking away from the building and in a Dark Knight kind of fashion. Dragon, you see like a part of the building blow up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Essentially, you just he when the guy got the third little when the professor got the third little wrong, he turned these giant canisters of flammable gas on, and he just he left they locked him in the room while it was right, tied up. Right. It just it's uh, explosive to say the least. When they with his cool show and was walking away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, and of course that gives us our cold open, solid cold open on Gotham. Yeah, right. solid props. You're props. very right, very solid. <laughs> Gets the thumbs okay. up from Poppy. 
<laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. So uh, your name is on to his next victim, which we'll find All out right. who that is. On to his, on to his next. <laughs> so, uh, meanwhile, Catherine is testing Doppelbruce. Because let's not forget, folks, because, again, it's been a while. <laughs> Doppelbruce right, right. Uh, was, was <laughs> captured by, by the Corvallis. Like, Talon injected uh, injected Doppelbruce, and he was just kind of take, put into Catherine's uh, limousine. That's it, the last we saw of him. So... Well, I'm sorry. That's the main. That's in the recap. So that's why I'm thinking less. So I actually saw like he's all he's been prepped and ready. And now we're getting to seeing how prepped and ready he is. Like he was up here at the end of the last episode we saw, like close to the end of the last episode. The point is, Catherine is is testing Doc Bruce's progress since capturing and training him. Some people have, su have suggested he's been brainwashed, and we'll see how much that's come true. Like if he's actually buying into the quarter, or if he's been brainwashed. Anyway. So he's been trained, to say the least, and he's been trained to say, uh, you know, he basically recount. Uh, the Wayne murder beat by beat, like through like Bruce's first person perspective. Even like I, I like the touch of having small memories, like you know, he remembers the cat in the alleyway uh -huh. and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Of course a little bit of a Selena Kyle reference to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So again now uh Dublin Bruce is a Selena Selena. Yep. <laughs> so now, uh, so now, uh, Doppel Bruce is a disciple of the of the Court of Elves, which is a dangerous combination. And Catherine's saying, "Excellent, my dear." Which, again, I'm, I'm really liking Cat. I've always liked Cat. She, she is fun. Kind of, she is fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think she's. A, I think we have really good faces of the Court of Elves because usually we don't get that. Usually we never really see the face of the members of the Court of Elves. We got in here and there, like kind of members, like towards the tail in the in the book. You know, we saw. A few people behind the mask towards the tail end, but you know we never really got to see like kind of reoccurring faces of like, oh yeah, these are notable members of the court. Anyway, so Catherine, uh, a very you know she congratulates him very, you you truly are Bruce Wayne. And then uh, she calls Frank with the news, tells him, okay, uh, okay, uh, Bruce Wayne, quote unquote, is ready. I don't know those exact words, but okay, Bruce, we're all ready here. And then, of course, now while she's been tasked with preparing Bruce, the Bruce Wayne side of things, uh, Frank has, has been given a family matter of convincing his nephew. Because let's not forget a big twist of the last again, of that episode. Again, was, let's you know, let's just pick back up on this plot line. <laughs> uh, Gordon comes up to Uncle Frank's, and then four months later, we finally continue this family reunion. No, no, no. <laughs> he wasn't just like he wasn't heading to see Uncle Frank. Uncle Frank stopped by his doorstep. All right, time has passed. We okay, well, you know what? That makes it even worse, all right? Because it's like we, we don't even know the context behind it. <laughs> anyway, this, this, the, basically, the, the, where we saw Frank last, he just appeared at the, he used the right, right. Gordon doorstep. And they acknowledge in the original reason we're being so coy about is that they do acknowledge in the episode that weeks have passed in like here and there. And, to, and it's, uh, it's just really kind of like, why do they have to? Silly. Anyway, ridiculous. Yeah, like a week I get because again that happens. Like, okay, we can't do this episode this week or two at the most. But like, it's been months. Right. right. Well, it feels like months. Probably actually like a month and change, but it doesn't matter. The fact is, uh, Frank Gordon, uh, of course, the uh, the long lost uncle that we're gonna get a wonderful line from Bullock later on about the uh, <laughs> long lost uncle of uh, of of Jim Gore. I know how silly that sounds, but so far they're winning me over. On it. Uh, we have Frank. Uh, Frank Gordon is uh, is been tasked with winning over Jim, so he can so he can uh, join the court of Owls. The court wants Jim Gordon to join their join their ranks. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So uh, they uh, yeah, Catherine reminds. That. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Catherine reminds him that uh, you know if his nephew needs to be on board or else essentially you know or else he knows it needs to be done, which means you know, if he's if he's not with us, he's against us. Which means. <laughs> <dead>. <laughs> right. Right. In other words, they'll send the talent for his head. No, no, but uh, <laughs> then we have uh, Doppel Bruce like Alfred Pennyworth has been with me since birth, and he's been my guardian since my parents died. It's so creepy. To that effect. It's so creepy. <laughs> as she says, "Do the rest," and while he's saying that, she's like filling a needle. And we know what happens to that needle later on. It's so so cruel. You don't know, like, oh gosh, she's going to inject him again just because she has to, or. <laughs> Again, I do like that's kind of like a little thing that pays off uh, later like on. Like a Winter Meanwhile, Soldier type situation going on with Doppel Breeze in a way. Yes, yeah, quite possibly. And we don't know how well they've been treating them. Probably, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe the, the court's a little more civilized than uh, the Indian Hill staff. Sure, sure. <laughs> anyway, so as Jim arrives, uh, Jim arrives there. Uh, Doppel Bruce is going through the uh, 
is, is going through the Alfred uh, preparation. We're at uh, we're at uh, Cobble, the Cobblepot Mansion or the Vandal Mansion, to be more exact. Uh, Nigma is, is taking hallucinogenic pills. <laughs> After reading about the mayor's disappearance, again, this address is like, it winks without the mayor. Right. Uh, and now, Dragon, I, I got to admit, when I first saw this device, I was like, yeah. okay, this is a good compromise to get Corey, my, you know, to keep uh, Robin Lord, Lord Taylor on the show and, you know, have him as kind of like the the mother type yeah. character, if you will. You of course, know? we've had this funny runner with Penguin in the last, like, season the literary two of Gotham. references, but... yes, yes. Yeah, the, well, and the film references, too, but yeah, mostly literary, yeah, because they think of their books based, movies based on books. Oh, uh, One Flew Over the so Cuckoo's of course Nest, had... Clockwork Orange. Cinderella. Yeah. <laughs> And now we're kind of, uh, well, if, if you want to be technical, it still fits the mold because we have Robert Blotch's Psycho. Psycho, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> more, it's more Bates Motel, to be honest. But, you know, I'm saying if you really want to, be, if you want to keep the pattern going, you could always say, yeah, it's a... It's and, a, of, course, it's a of course, Mr. Robot did this before Bates Motel even did this, so... <laughs> well, well, no, it didn't Bates Motel. No, Bates Motel did before Mr. Robot. Well, like, I, I'm saying the specific thing of having, like, the stand-in for the dead character... All right, all right. Let's not. Split it, it, hairs. You're right. It's it's kind of it's kind of muddy. It's kind of muddy. But anyway, let's muddy the waters. So <laughs> muddying the waters. Oh god! God bless Paige. Oh, we love Paige. So uh, the penguin appears. Uh, so what we're saying here, we've been uh, dancing around. Is that the penguin appears after Nigma takes one of these pills. There's a little box full of pills. Takes these pills. They're not to prevent hallucinations. They are like Norman Bates would approve these pills. He would take like these. By the hand, by the hand, by the yes, he would. Yes, he would. Uh, <laughs> uh, a penguin appears soaked on the couch, uh, and I love this idea that you know the, oh he God. appears as Nigma would imagine. Like what if penguin lived <laughs> through my show? What would it, what would it be like? He'd be, be around, be hanging around, just you know, be constantly covered in crap from the from the bay. You know and what's funny just, is that it kind of reminds me of something that they'd showcase in like a Pirates of the Caribbean movie, like a dead pirate who's constantly underwater or something like that. Like it's a cool effect. I like it. Uh, and then, of course, I love how Brutaler's like freaking out, like, what I tell you about drinking water on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, uh, Penguin's point now, you know, uh, you know. Uh, you're the only one who frets about drug-induced hallucinations <laughs> making a mess. Oh God! This then we have so like this. This is a very, very, very minor gripe. We have like this okay. weird, out of place looking CG crab crawling up Penguin's arm. But that's what I'm talking about with the Pirates of the Caribbean, though. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that bugged you too a little. Just like this modern, modern little buggy. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's CG. Crab. <laughs> right, right. I'm all for the crab. I'm just saying, can we, we couldn't have gotten back in the Spielberg days. We would have had like a real crab placed on the guy. <laughs> back now, in the Spielberg now we're, days, man. Now we're. Spielberg month coming up in June. Yeah. Yes. All right. It's on our minds. That's why. So, uh, so basically, as he voices us, uh, so Penguin here essentially is voicing kind of enigma. And of course, much in the Bates Motel style, we have our, 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 our psychological perceptions of people voicing what our characters are thinking. So basically, it's kind of a, it's enigma having a conversation with himself only to the Penguin. <laughs> so uh, Penguin is kind of voicing Nigma's uh, paranoia and the inevitability of what he's doing. In a way, he's he's pointing out what the audience and readers have pointed out about Riddler for years of like, why are you leaving clues for your crimes? <laughs> right, right. That's essentially, what, that's essentially what he's doing. He's voicing the logical side of Nigma saying, no, you shouldn't become a villain. What's wrong with you, you idiot? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's see. So. Uh, we basically uh, kind of find out the whole reason why Ed's going on this killing spree, and it's basically to find a life coach. <laughs> a killing spree for <laughs> searching for a life coach. God. Oh, God. I love the, uh, the act. There's, the staging of this is great, how we have them mimicking their movements, like when Nigma scratches. Yeah, yeah you're the, right. I'm glad you put that Taylor out. Yeah. I like guess it's, 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 it's great stuff. Uh, so again, they was chatting with his fallen mentor, uh, kind of, uh, kind of like a dark, uh, more dark, realistic force ghost, essentially. Oh, uh -huh. well, until the ending, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, Penguin is asking, uh, you know, why, you know, why riddles? Why leave riddles? And then uh, we get some cool insight to the Riddler's kind of motivation uh, here, and we get some great dialogue from Riddler throughout this episode. Like, uh, you know, uh, to solve a riddle, uh, to s basically talking about riddles, to solve it is to solve. Uh, to solve it is to solve the mystery of a person, of the person posing it. Basically, what this says is that Riddler, the reason he asked Riddle, 
Nigma's asking Nigma gives riddles as a way of improving and evolving himself as he did via you know Kringle and via Jim Gordon and he you know, he gave those people riddles and in the end they they kind of got him into his next arc they progressed him as a character he finds out more about himself the more riddles he gives that's kind of his been his justification but to do the thing is a really clever idea with the riddler yeah you're right i i, I actually think in this show surprisingly it, it is like along with the penguin this show doesn't get enough credit for sort of like reinventing these villains i think because yeah cause I'm, I'm, the riddler and the penguin i feel like these are like really, really good interpretation for the characters. That I mean, that is a really yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say it was a really clever idea of just uh, you know again he, the Riddler. Hence, I wish they hit it upon this a little later on when we get to it. But uh, again, the fact that he asked riddles not not to not to question people at it at the end of the day, but to kind of you know, question himself. That's that's an interesting hmm. concept. All right. Okay then. And now, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for Bullock and Fox. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. We still got a lot of Riddler to go through. God damn it, really? It's not a whole lot. That was just, you know, so we got more, though. Uh, you just ruined my bit. You just ruined my transition. Now I just want to crawl up into a hole. Go ahead and finish your Riddler <laughs> stuff. Anyway, so... As I tell, me this, when I'm tell, tell me when you're ready to get to I'll my cue awesome you. transition. I'll, I'll cue you. All right. Go ahead. So we're uh, so Nigma is processing Penguin's words via the conversation. You know, villains do not have teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Penguin is ushering uh, the evolution in, in, in Enigma. You know, this uh, Enigma's plot by pointing out uh, that you know that Penguin was self-made. You know, he points out you know Enigma's convinced that you know he needs you know that again he needs a teacher then penguin points out he gets to one of my favorite elements that i've called for the whole series uh, uh, penguin says you know he was self he was self-made you know he didn't have a teacher you know when he just he threw fish moon and they're bringing up fish moon because we're going to see fish moon again by the way uh, yeah you're right i do i'm glad you bring this up actually because uh i, I find it interesting that that was sort of the uh breaking point for him i mean because we've seen him do other dubious acts throughout season one but that was really the turning point i guess it makes sense because of the whole like i am the king of gotham thing with fish mooney but i know I, that was a little interesting observation to at least i guess like what 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 enigma interprets oswald's motivation to be, you know what i mean because there is that sort of gray area there yeah yeah so i mean penguin's pointing out that he was self-made and this leads enigma to realize uh you know he doesn't this, this is the part i'm talking about here like enigma doesn't basically enigma realizes he doesn't need a teacher he needs an enemy I love that idea because I've always been saying, you know, he's been in search of a Batman. Nigma, the reason he's he put Yeah, him in right. It is a very like I said, it is very much kind of the Joker looking for a Batman in a lot yes. of ways. Yeah. That to me is an idea I've always been in love with with the show. I've always been looking especially ever since in season two when he targeted Gordon because oh my god, he's looking for a Batman. He's a, that's a, you know, he's looking for a Batman and Gordon's been looking for a Batman figure. I thought those those I, ideas have been so so interesting. Like, okay, that's why, you know, Gordon's had these like figures like Penguin and these kind of these figures you can help him out or kind of on the outside outskirts of the law and you have uh of course, you have uh, this with, with, with the real fact that he was going to go through all these people, as he quite literally does in this episode. He's going through all these, the, the most intelligent people in Gotham, mm -hmm. and keeps killing them. Which is such like kind of a classic Batman premise. It's like kind of, a, again, dark 60s Batman. Kind of uh, yeah, team. very much so. This episode definitely fits that mold. <laughs> but also, it feels like kind of very much like the 40s esque kind of Riddler. Of like, you know, you have these kind of the kind of the old era of Riddler, which is, you know, he has like a kind of a spree, a pattern of crime, kind of classic Batman 101 type stuff, you know, criminals have a pattern and we're kind of, it's like a, it's like a genuine mystery. Sure, sure. So again, just the, yeah, he's in search, uh, search of a Batman totally called and I love it. Um, Penguin is, uh, so Penguin is part of the psyche that points out that, you know, he, that, what's so interesting is season two, we opened with Riddler be, as he was becoming the Riddler. He had the, the ego and we had Edward Nygma, remember? Yeah, yeah. And of course, here Penguin's a fun kind of reverse of that, where Penguin is the part of his psyche that points out, you know, his ego and his gimmick are self-defeating or the self-defeating trap. And again, he's like he's a self-defeating villain, and this part of him is the logical side. And even pointing this out, it's such a switch of the ego personality. It's like the ego saying, "Yeah, do more of this, man. More riddles, <laughs> more everything." This one saying, "No, you idiot, you're going to get caught. Stop it." Sure, sure. <laughs> Okay, and kind then of we like the Bates Motel back and forth going on. <laughs> then we get one of my favorite, one of my favorite lines from the episode. 
getting so bad. Please. <laughs> Basically, as, as so after Riddler is realized, after Enigma is realized, okay, I need an enemy. And of course, I knew this was coming out so happy. And I just love the fact that it's with the penguin, of course. Penguin I feel like this. this is also a fourth wall breaking joke. Like, yeah, yeah, Gordon is kind of every villain's Batman on this show. Like, every villain. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes sense, though, because you know, Enigma, and, Enigma and Gordon have had their rivalry and everything. And again, he was the original Batman figure he, he chose for himself. Sure, sure. Because <laughs> again, he, he just again Gordon looked at him funny. Essentially, he was wasn't even remotely on to him, and he just kind of made Gordon his Batman. Oh, <laughs> for, for that reason, says his just Penguin just trying to cut him off, saying, "Please do not say Jim Gordon." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, Fun that's stuff. that's that's hysterical. So, uh, gonna love the idea for a. Uh, I love the idea. The last thing here before we transition. Uh, I love the idea that we the need for a Batman creates uh, Riddler, and Gotham set him down this path. Again, this feeding the whole Gotham creating its villains and its heroes idea, which is kind of the the crux of what the show should be going for. When the show's at its best, it's kind of playing into these ideas, kind of playing into these Scott Snyderian ideas. Sure, sure. You know, like you know, Gotham, it, it gave him. You know, and what got how this kind of plays in the Gotham as as the whole kind of scope of it is that you know, Gotham set him down this path it gave him purpose to make uh, make the inhabitants smarter it's kind of the idea of Riddler what what he does as a villain in the function of Gotham is he you can only exist in Gotham if you're the smartest most detective like presence in Gotham if you're smart enough you can exist in Gotham that's Riddler's challenge to the city that's what set him down the path and of course uh, until he meets Batman the only opponent that could stop him that's where he gets <laughs> A wonderful little tap. Well, I mean, it's going to make you little... wonder, like, how, how he will interact with Bruce Wayne in the future, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting. And, of course, they had their death trap scene at the end of, at the end of two, so that that's was, true. was kind of That's cool. true, yeah. <laughs> we'll tease at that, and again, love it. that sets us... Speak of, speaking of character who was in that death trap, uh, the wonderful okay. and talented uh, Lucius Fox. So let's see uh, let's see what that scene is like in this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Bullock and Fox, the new buddy cop spinoff coming soon to the ironically named Fox Network. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. All right, Dragon, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I was like really proud of that transition. I was like totally jumped the gun on actually using it, and now I just totally ruined it. So we're just going to, yeah, Bullock and Fox. Seriously, uh, I, I, I just applaud the show for finally giving Lucius Fox his due and making him like a central focus of this episode because he really earned it, man. Yeah, such kind of a fun, inspired idea that, you know what, yeah, Lucius Fox has been the guy we've established who can solve the Riddler's riddles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then meanwhile, Harvey Dent is just in the corner, like, just biding his time, looking at his watch. <laughs> He's calling Howard Hamlin saying, come on, oh, man, give me some pointers. <laughs> all right, all right, but, uh... So let's see. So uh, Lucius is kind of laying out this uh, pattern of of targeting people of the intellectual community. Bullock's kind of skeptical about it. And Bullock also kind of points out that they're still, again, Dragon, weeks later, they're still dealing with the aftermath of Remember Jerome? You know, remember how that whole thing went out? Well, and one, that's kind of a fun fourth wall gig. Remember that amazing story we had with, with, with Jerome? Right, right. I mean, but also it's kind of like it makes sense. That was a huge event. There was like a lot of chaos and stuff. They're still probably cleaning up. So I kind of again, I, I don't mind like the some of the explanations they have. It, just, it bugs me like why did we have to go so long with it? <laughs> sure, sure. But again, I mean, they, they I, it always kind of bugs me when they have to write that into the episode. They have to do that with another show. Is watching Reese? Oh, oh, Flash. Uh, I won't date it too much. I won't say where when it okay. is in the season. Okay. Just say. In Flash, what they've done is they've nailed down an exact date, which basically says, on this day, which I checked the calendar, actually will fall on this day when Flash airs. This happens. <laughs> it's like, okay, guys, that's a little on the nose. Do we have to do the exact, exact day? It's, it's going to be like, oh, isn't that kind of, it's a, it's a promotional marketing thing. In four weeks, this happens. Well, it's kind of like, you remember the SpongeBob thing where we just recently had, like, the day where Squidward travels to the future? <laughs> Anyways. Anyway. Or of course uh, the most famous it. example, the Back to the Future 2. Mm. Well goes. true. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's a Bullock and Lucius. So Lucius is telling him about the uh the serial killer of smart people, as Bullock likes the likes to phrase it. <laughs> Ooh, 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Lucius actually knew the professor, uh, uh, Professor Dyson. He was one of his uh, one of his mentors. I guess one of his teachers. Again, I like that we are tying a few things here, kind of mentorship, but later on, uh, definitely reflections, which we'll do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, Lucius Professor uh, was uh, was the most recent killing. Uh, so Bullock, Bullock's skeptical because, again, they're, uh, yeah, because, again, a lot of them were made to look like suicides or accidents. Again, kind of lab blowing up. I imagine, like, Nygma may have, may have like, kind of may look like kind of a suicide death trap for a few of them. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, it's up in Nygma's alley. Um. Let's see. So, uh, you know, then uh, Bullock has some great lines. You, any, any of those you like to share about the uh, about the lab gag? Oh, honestly, I don't have any Bullock lines written down here. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, Bullock's point out, like, you're getting bored down that lab, are you? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and Lucius is acknowledging, yes, a little, but that's not the point. <laughs> but yeah, I could, I could kind of see it though. I could kind of see Lucius just kind of like biting his time, twiddling his thumbs. You know, he's like, you know what? I'm not gonna be like the Harvey Dents of the world. I'm gonna go up there and demand <laughs> screen time. Yeah, because again, Lucius does want to be <laughs> there. As it's like again, Lucius mentioned he hates the he hates the conditions of the GCPD, but I mean, he loves the work. Yeah, yeah, he's, sure, sure. Of course, he really cares. He really loves his job, and he really just loves kind of being part of, like, you know, helping out. Which, of course, he's going to be able to do with Batman down the line. Mm. Okay, let's see. So, uh, so then after that, so Bullock, uh, you know, again, Bullock's point at the leftover Jerome madness uh, from his uh, Jerome's night of Mur <laughs> night of murder and mayhem, which is love as a title. I could have been a title. <laughs> so. I go to a Halloween Horror Nights maze. Around that, as we already yep, pointed out, that they have a great Halloween Horror Nights maze. I'm sorry, go ahead. They have a missing mayor, and their hands are their hands are full. You know, no, uh, their, their hands are full, and there are no resources to allocate uh, to allocate for Lucius's hunch. And uh, Bullock points out, see how they use the word allocate? <laughs> right, right. So I love see, the I idea. can be smart too, Lucius. <laughs> I love the fa I love that it ties into Bullock's story. By the way, is that he's reading up on on for his big speech. He's kind of making a really eloquent speech. That's why <laughs> right, he, that's right. why he suddenly knows what Alan. <laughs> he's just trying to incorporate in that day to day. Oh, day, -to -day <laughs> and that's also why he's dressing like Commissioner Gordon. By the way, that's why he's dressing in the fancy. He's wearing his best suit this episode because he's trying to pull off the, the, the later Commissioner look that Gordon wears mm. constantly. I'm saying again. You look at some of the, especially when we get into the, the death of the family at some point. You can see Gordon dresses looks exactly like Bullock does in this scene. Okay. So, uh, so Jim, uh, sorry, yeah, right. Uh, oh, Jim's on R and R uh, as he as Bullock puts it, he's reconnecting with his long lost uncle. So again, Gordon's unavailable, and that's why you know he's not getting wrapped up in this Enigma stuff. Which, by the way, we've been really building. G Gordon and Enigma have not had a scene together this season. That's true. And now that you bring it up, yeah. And again, they have some big issues to hash out because again, Gordon technically lost the baby because, and his whole relationship with Lee went to, went to crap because of Nigma. Nigma's the root of all Gordon's problems. Uh, yeah, I mean, like probably the the worst stuff that's happened to Gordon through the series has been because of Nigma for sure. Oh yeah, and they've never been able to kind of hash out how much they hate each other because of that. <laughs> Okay, but then we get um, we get a very bizarre, you know, delivery system in place at the GCPD in the form of <laughs> this was priceless in the form of uh, Hey Arnold style giant. <laughs> Tell me you You're didn't. right. Oh, God. I didn't think. Of I literally just thought of that like just now on the fly. I was like, oh my god, it is Hey Arnold. <laughs> Especially with the second one. The second one's absolutely hell. <laughs> so we get, oh, by the way, that's something they can beat that. You want to know what's funny? Uh, sure, sure. Look on IMDb, look for some names for like the professor and other characters, and we do have a name on one of the fruit guys. Oh, God. <laughs> so our fruit messengers, which is kind of Nygma's delivery system of choice to the GCPD, because who doesn't like fruit? <laughs> is, uh, you know, you know it's, 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 it's fruit, it's a lot of stuff's flavored after fruit. I mean, of course, you know, edible arrangements. Give 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 up give Jim Gordon extra extra heavy on the pineapple. Uh, we get the uh, we get the fruit. That's an obscure better call so I'll reference with folks out there anyway. So, uh, uh, fruit messenger's name is Bunch O Grapes. Bunch O Grapes. Oh God. Bunch O Grapes. <laughs> like Bunch O first name Bunch O last name Grain Grapes. It might be Bunch O Grapes. Uh huh. But, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think of, of it as just Buncho Grapes. Buncho. Anyways. <laughs> okay, so he well, has a message. Bun well, sister's Buncho Grapes. <laughs> Alright, so he has a message. Uh, in the happy birthday... 
in the happy birthday tune, which I will not, uh, I, I won't be reciting it in the happy birthday tune. But, but. Ruka, I just want to point out this, the thing that just cracked me up real quick. So just, a man dressed in, in grapes walks in the GCPD calling for Jim Gordon, Jim Gordon. It's like the absurdity of which people just come in, there's always always something going on with Jim Gordon. Like, the GCPD is always probably clamoring with, hey, Jim Gordon's up to something. Remember the guy's going through all this crap? He's not it's like an average Tuesday at the GCPD. Like, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah, some like, lunatic I, I, in a fruit costume running around looking for Jim Gordon. Yeah, yeah I was, whatever. I was dying to be at the water cooler. Here, over here, the water cooler talk at the GCPD. Of like, oh, do you hear what Gordon got into this week? What? Oh, yeah, there was, there was the guy in a fruit costume came in called for him. Get out of here. I don't believe it. You're putting me on. No, I, I swear to God. There was a guy in a bunch of grapes costume. Handed me his business card. Bunch of grapes. I'm not, I'm not lying. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then he goes and kind of his happy birthday yeah, theme. Six, ma six masters have passed. There's about to be more. King, queen, and their core. Key to saving them is on their card, so won't you please help save them? Uh, and he gives Lucius a card. Yeah. Yes, gives him a, a card with a puzzle clue on it. Uh, Lucius, it I love uh, this. The Lucius tips the guy. He yes, tips him yes, change. Yes, yes. I'm sure you noticed <laughs> that. Yeah. I, just, I just love the fact that Lucius had that again. Bullock didn't tip him uh, because again, it's about murder and stuff. So yeah, he's like, like he's giving bad news. <laughs> uh, but I love the fact that Lucius tips him. But again, he kind of finds the ultimate balance. He tips him change, and the guy looks all disgusted at him. Hey, you got change, buddy. You got a tip. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you had to sing to a, a, a police department about plans of murder. Don't, don't. You don't get cash for that. <laughs> Okay. Anyways, then Bullock gives uh, gives it a oh, go on. Yeah, uh, basically Lucius kind of connects the dots. I don't know what you're going to say about Bullock, but Lucius connects the dots to uh, you know talking at the Knights Templar, talking uh, connecting to chess. Essentially, yeah, and basically basically a Knights tour. That's what all the squiggly lines, all the kind of the, right, the right. angular uh, lines on the thing means. Uh, I was going to say Bullock uh, Bullock's uh, given uh, given it a chance because he was skeptical of what was uh, going on. Sure, sure. So he was giving it a chance because you know Lucius kind of sold them on it. It's a night nice tour. Then we have this fun guy or book just completely lost on what it means. He says, "Yeah, and it means." And then he just <laughs> what a pause. And you know, Lucius absolutely knows what it, what it means. A chess tournament, which is our next scene. Chess tour at the big Gotham chess tournament. Yeah, all the kids are talking about it. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So Riddler, uh, he takes another. Man, pill Fish Mooney's there. Oh, God. For Bobby Fish. Or <laughs> See, Bobby Fish is down there, and he's playing. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so uh, Riddler summons the penguin and very politely thanks the penguin for coming. <laughs> Not the penguin had a choice because, again, he's an aberration of being sick to brave mind. And the dragon, I, I love this, how we, we cut to commercial, then we come back and, uh, you know, Ed, Ed says, like, oh, don't worry, you're going to you're gonna want to see what I do here. And then Penguin's munching up popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I love this. This is so ridiculous. It's like, you know, Pen well, Penguin's chowing down, Nygma's shouting <laughs> strategies, like, from the balcony, like, the old guys right, from the Muppets. Right. Like, like, Statler and Waldorf from the These are, like, the ultimate Statler and Waldorf from the Muppets. Oh, from God. Gotham. <laughs> Yeah, one just couldn't care less, and the other one's just saying, "Hey, hey, do it better." <laughs> so um, you call you can call anyone a grandmaster these days. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Jeff Goldblum. That's what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make it clear. I, I'm full support of Jeff Goldblum's grandmaster. I'm in full support of that. So, uh, yeah, Penguin uh, trying to yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I just don't know what you're talking about with the Goldblum and Grandmaster thing. I'm not connecting the dots. He's playing but... Grandmaster in Thor: The Ragnarok. Oh, oh, okay. That's the name of his character. I'm sorry. I don't know the name of his character because I'm a casual. Okay. Anyways, I'm dumb. So Penguin, uh, <laughs> so Penguin tries. Uh... Well, let's see. So. Uh... Oh, so Penguin tries confronting Nigma with the real reason for all this. We're getting this. Yeah, you know, the mystery. It's kind of, kind of the, the the main sticking point of Nigma's search for an enemy. Like, again, while that is cool as being thematically, the big idea is what Riddler is going to be doing. But uh, again, at his core, why all of this is coming about now? Why he's kind of on the path of becoming Riddler now? So Penguin wants him to face. Uh, Penguin's trying to. Uh, the real reason for all this, is, as Penguin points out, is that he can't. As, as he points out, you, know, you can't hide things from your inner psyche. 
Right, right. <laughs> Again, he's just kind of point at the Bates Motel while it's you know, like you can't really hide secrets from yourself. The other one's are gonna know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you of all people should know this, and I love how he points it out because again, season two, he's he's debating with himself about you know his ego, the the Riddler ego he's been contending with. So he absolutely knows what this sort of things like keeping secrets from himself because he had to go on a search for Miss Kringle's body through the GCPD <laughs> keep a secret from himself. Uh, you know, you need to face the truth, and again, is the name is really trying to avoid facing the truth. We'll get more specifics on that uh, soon. So then, uh, as soon as he sees the police show up, he's instantly kind of uh, elated until he realizes that Gordon's not there. Kind of my reaction, but you know. yeah, <laughs> God, really? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not holding. I'm just saying it's my ordinary reaction of like, yeah, is he there? Oh, no, he's not. Let's see. <laughs> but no, 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 it's, no, it's fine here. Yeah, he's doing other stuff. So the GCPD arrive. Uh, no Jim Gordon, but who solved mine? They realize it's this old pal, Foxy. Oh, Foxy. <laughs> Uh, Enigma is intrigued by this because, again, he's had a rapport with Fox. The only other guy who's been able to solve his riddles. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, it's Lucius Fox. That guy's giving me a run for my money. Uh, he, uh, and we see early on what he's done is he's basically he's set charges, like electrifying charges underneath the uh, the little chest timer. So basically if someone yeah, like, hit the timer, yeah. they get like a big zets. And uh, now that the GCP are there, he activates it, and uh, you know they, uh, the few chess players, you know, they hit their timers. <laughs> you know, no one, everyone move, everyone get out. Wait, no, no, everyone freeze. Because <laughs> happening a few more. Forget what I just up. said. <laughs> <laughs> he's no Cat and Barnes. <laughs> no, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> then again, he's not a psycho who's tearing people apart with his bare hands. So that's probably a good thing. <laughs> so, we guilty, have, uh, then, uh, guilty, <laughs> guilty. So uh, meanwhile, uh, Jim and his uh, his uncle Frank are playing catch up. <laughs> oh God! Oh God! Uh, so again, Jim's asking some very straightforward questions. You know, why did you disappear? Uh, what what happened between you and my father? Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, you know, Frank's promising all in all in time, all in time. But he needs Jim to trust him. And uh, yeah, you know, he's Jim's just kind of being vague. He's just sort of beat, beating around the issue a little bit. But he he does say that he regrets, you know, like leaving. Leaving uh, Peter Gordon was one of the big regrets in his life, so we do get that yeah, well, at least. We get a really excellent line that that precedes that uh, one. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. First, first and foremost, you know, Jim saying, uh, "Your your family, uh, uh, your family." Of course, I trust you. With that, of course, I like the sense that Gordon, on some level, he does believe in that, but that gets challenged this episode about his his inherent kind of. Of kind of sense of, of trust, you know, if someone's like family, it's like kind of instant trustworthy kind of cred you have. But then uh, Peter Gordon, oh, sorry, not Peter, Frank Gordon, I think the father. No. Frank, Frank is a really good line. I really love this line. I love him posing this to Jim Gordon because we've seen him go through this for about uh, two, two or three seasons. I think the beginning of season three definitely went through this. Crux of season three, Gordon's gone through this. He says, "Have you ever done something that you felt was right at the time, but you would give your life to sure, do over?" Sure. Which, of course, Jim has, you know, he's gone through in season two and he's uh, been on the path of undoing that for season three. So, again, all of that, uh, I love that it's kind of tying in the season three as well. It's a really good line. And Jim, of course, says yes. And then uh, Frank relates it to himself, saying, you know, he's, uh, he regrets breaking from, uh, breaking off from Peter. Uh, and he's returned to Gotham uh, to, uh, to reconnect with Jim, which is not entirely untrue. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Not entirely, I, I, will but... admit, I will admit I do like how they are playing Frank as kind of like we still even at the end of the episode we're not entirely sure what side he's on. So true, true, and of course we have the wonderful James Remar who not only can play kind of the supportive kind of loving father figure, he can also play kind of the, the ruthless villain at the same time. So it's kind exactly, of hard to talk. exactly. And by the way, I just kind of realized something. You tell me if this sounds crazy. Uh, you uh, you remember the, the Lon Chaney Jr. Wolfman at all? Uh, that's, I, I'll, I'll admit that's one of the Universal Monster movies that's not really fresh in my memory. Well, it was in Abbey Still Meet Frankenstein, you remember that at all? Uh, I, I, it's been a while. I know you're going to be reacquainted with it soon, but. Yeah, it, it's been a while. <laughs> anyway, well, remember, uh, remember Freakazoid when he ran to the Wolfman in Freakazoid? It's been, it, it, just get your reference, man, I'm not, I'm not going <sighs> to, I'm sorry. It's, I, I kind of had this weird thing in the episode where I kind of realized, oh my god, James Remar will make an excellent Lonnie, uh, Lonnie Talbot for the, the guy. 
he'd actually be an ex. He sounds a lot like the Wolfman when he's like saying, when the moon is full, I, when he's going over the history of, of, of the court later on, he's like, you know, when it sounds like when the moon is full, you know, I turn into the werewolf. It sounds, oh my God, he could actually be an excellent, you know, if they ever did well, a, a I, I will admit that, uh, th that I, I did like the Benicio del Toro Wolfman and found that movie to be really underrated. So, well, my, my uh, point is just because I have biopics have been on my mind lately with the founder. I was thinking like, he would make an excellent, uh, you know, Lon Chaney Jr. If they did a movie about that. Uh -huh. Anyway, so uh, so following that, uh, Alfred, get Alfred. Alfred's uh, teaching Bruce how to how to throw throwing stars, but you know, yeah, I'd say Alfred. Knives. 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't don't crucify me. I I, I didn't see what they were. Uh, huh? But uh, well, you know, yeah. what they were. Well, I, I'm sorry. It happens. It's fine. Fast. It's fine. God. God. Just don't yell at me. I'm not yelling at you. Just tell you they were not. They were not, they were not stars. Okay. But, um, so Alfred, you know, he's a little off his game with, uh, he, he's given good advice, but he's very much like, as Bruce is going to throw it, he's very much like distracting Bruce at the same well, time. Well, that's the point. He's trying to get him to go through distractions. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like a golfer, you know what I mean? Like the, the yeah. guy yelling distractions at a golfer. Yeah. <laughs> And what's kind of cool about this is like, oh my god, Alfred's teach he's trading him with the- uh, I just got such a kick out of this, I'm a fan of Oh, he's teaching Batman how to throw batarangs, it's so cool! In a way, yeah, yeah. yeah. Step towards that. <laughs> so Alfred's, uh, yeah, again, Alfred's distracting him mid-throw to prove a point, and, he, and he's br using this as an excuse to bring up his distraction with Selena Kyle. Mm-hmm. Bruce denies this. That he's Bruce denies that he's unfocused. Alfred shows Bruce a note that he received from "quote unquote" Selena Kyle. Oh yeah, totally. asking for a meeting. And uh, I like this. I like that Bruce is. Uh, he's kind of playing hard to get here. I really like that thing. It's been and this again bringing up the weeks thing. It's been weeks since uh, since we've <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's been weeks since uh, since I've heard from her. It's going to take oh. a lot more than a note to have me running. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, it's kind of like, uh, like, like a peanuts, like Charlie Brown. I'm not going to kick the football. The other time she's pulled oh the football away right, from me. Right. <laughs> okay, so Ooh, Lucius she's... is uh, studying the chessboard. He's kind of looking at all the pieces. And uh, let's see. Uh, Nigma. Oh, God. Lucius, uh, he's going through the, the rigged chess equipment. He happens upon the chessboard, and he sees that he knocks the pieces over, and he finds on purpose. He's flipping all the chess, uh, chess pieces over, and underneath them, on the green parts of the chess, the, the little felty green parts uh -huh. of the chess pieces, uh, he discovers a phone number. And then, uh, meanwhile, we have Riddler up on, uh, you know, overlooking this, and he's like, don't you know it's bad to go, it's rude to go through other people's mail? You know, the telegram, and he tells him, you know, Gordon's not in, as, you know, as, he's, as he calls him, they're kind of chatting it up on the phone. He basically informs, it's kind of like a Die Hard 3 moment, where he informs Fox, now you're stuck, now you, basically it's like Sam Jackson, Die Hard 3, now you're involved in this, whether you like it or not. Sure, sure. You know, he um, to, then, now uh, he has to face the test next. Then he gives a good riddle, I, I thought this was a really clever riddle, how they, how they, uh, got it all out uh when the pawns on queen they'll be one step closer to the belly of the beast that we get that answer uh you know through how they find the next clue which i thought was really clever anyways so uh and, and Nigma says he's one step closer to introducing himself to, to gotham we have the question mark portrait yeah so uh james remar uh not as good at trust exercises on this show as he is on dexter i gotta tell you this was a very bad trust exercise or maybe you know, it's, it's funny, just this... gordon like just not going along with the trust exercise because gordon literally like like fires a gun just to make sure it's loaded just to make sure he has ammunition against frank that is, like, yeah. that, that is a cool moment, though, just the idea. Like, first of all, I'm just thinking, okay, Gordon doesn't want to shoot the deer, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, it's even better. It's like he just he wants to make sure he has ammunition <laughs> in, right, in, case the, right. in case he turns on, in case it's like a setup of some kind. That's right. <laughs> you know, I, I like that you know, Gordon's been uh, kind of, again, with I think Nigma, oddly enough, has also been a very uh, good kind of like, don't want to put your trust in the wrong people sort of thing. So, you know, uh, uh, Gordon's like on, on edge with anyone he trusts. Uh, basically, uh, the minute Frank says he, he wants to reconnect with Jim, but still he's not getting straight answers. So he wants to make sure in case this guy isn't giving him straight answers. He comes out of the blue. It's been 20 years. A little suspect. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's intentionally misses. And I, I like that Frank's a little offended by this. Oh, come on, Jim. <laughs> 
he's still uh he's still waiting for the promised truth that Frank said he would tell him. And then we get this, and I got to hearing James Remar say this, I thought it was just undeniably cool. Uh, is Frank telling Jim the history of the Court of Owls? Like, oh yeah, <laughs> Remar talking about the court, and then, of course we get the kind of the, the kind of the summarized version of the Court of Owls history, which is the mm -hmm. century old secret society made up of Gotham's oldest, wealthiest, and most influential families. Mm -hmm. They are devoted to maintaining. Uh, now, love. Now, this is an, an interesting detail that is not untrue to the Court of Owls, but it's specified, and I think will definitely play into a huge element of the end of the season. So it's important. He mentions that the Court of Owls was initially devoted to maintaining the balance, a balance in Gotham. And over time, they became, uh, with their, over time and with the increasing power they got, they became corrupt. And they became, right, their right. core mission became corrupted. So they were all about kind of exercising Which their power. Which sounds about right, they, if I'm remembering, based on the book. Yeah, it's 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 in line with the Court of Owls, absolutely. Uh -huh. I'm just saying that we've never had it kind of like established that they start off as something pure that then got corrupted over time. That's kind of a interesting little little detail. It's kind of don't miss in there, kind of. But you're right though; it does absolutely line up. You know, they've always they've they had the best intentions for Gotham, but by sure, their sure. definition, what the best is. Anyway. So basically, it's kind of a little bit of a slippery slope of like, you know, well, we influence things. So basically, we're the final judges at the end of the day. We, the, the wealthy and the elite, choose what's best for God. And still, kind of, it's developed into that, though. Uh, let's see. So uh, Peter uh, Peter and Frank were members. This is a big reveal in the whole conversation here. So Peter, Gordon, and Frank Gordon were both members of the Court of Owls. The, uh, the court, and the court wants Jim to join, uh, join the court now. Big reveal. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See how that goes. All right, so the answer to the riddle was uh, it was a pawn shop on Queens Avenue. I don't know, Dragon. That was just simple and fun. I like the chess. I like the, I like the chess runner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of people nowadays are saying, we got too much chess. We got too much yeah. X-Men. It's chess all over the place. I mean, come on. This is fun. If it works, it works. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, this, was a, this was a fun little scene. You <laughs> yes, yes. Like Lucius, so like getting he's getting up in this guy's face, and he's explaining why. He's like, "Oh, it's a it's a personal space invading tactic, right, Bullock?" <laughs> now this is like where we get the real buddy cop show. Oh yeah, where Bullock oh, yeah. and Lucius are at their at their absolute finest, and this is like Bullock getting smarter with the interrogation techniques. He's always been pretty clever when it comes to interrogation. Basically, they're interrogating Winston Peter, the uh, an employee of the pawn shop, mm -hmm. and uh, he's, Bullock's got basically we have the nice suit threat. So Bullock's in his nicest suit, which is true, but not in, but not inaccurate for if you were just lying to someone to make him think something. So basically, Bullock says, uh, "Yeah, I'm in my nicest suit." Lucius hit him, and Lucius, of course, is the most nonviolent man. Right, right. Like, what? what? He says, "Hit him! I'm wearing my nice suit. I can't hit him." <laughs> and then uh, this is well, no, we don't need to hit it. We don't need to hit him. It said, "Belly of the beast." Hey, if you want to cavity search this big slob, by all means, go ahead. And I love this line; is priceless. Uh, uh, Winston here, he says, you could just hit me. Because <laughs> I imagine he's just looking at Lucius. He's like, yeah, yeah, I, I could handle it. It w probably wouldn't hurt me at all. <laughs> just say like, let's, let's not get handsy here, guys. Let's just go with the closed fist versus the, the pointed finger. <laughs> so, and then, uh, okay, let's see. So then uh, he reveals that he was covering for the owner's cousin who was working uh, when, when the thing came in. The Teddy, uh, a Teddy, uh, Terrio or something, uh, Teddy. Uh, I, I know in my notes it's like it's very close to the whole Mac, like Max Terry. Yeah, thing. I know. I know. That's that's Terrio. This is like a, this is Terrio. I think it's Terrio. I think it's like it, it's, it's T H E R. You know what's funny? You know what's funny is like it's in between the cor correct pronunciation of Max Terrio and uh, uh, Max Terriot, Terriot, and then. Uh, the pronunciation that we thought we were going with, you know, like yeah. Max A. Row, it's like kind of in between. It's Terry O. We've been on so many different names for that poor kid. We just, we, we've been butchering his name for four seasons and we finally got it right for the last one. I feel so bad for that. <laughs> well, we'll be praising the heck out of him for the series. Oh, you're for now. darn right. He might, have, he might have not only stolen America's heart, but maybe stolen some prestigious gold awards. You know what? I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Anyways, anyway, so I uh, so in checking the checking for the uh, the belly the belly of the beast clue. Uh, Terio it translates to uh, uh, in in Greek uh, his the last name translates to beast, which of course would play into the belly and the beast. So clue. Okay. And then mm -hmm. Lucia, uh, 
bullet points up. I, sometimes I think you make that stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. All right, let's see. Meanwhile, Alfred is making pie. And then uh, Harry Osborn just gets his interest peaked like, ooh, pie. No, here's the thing, though. Harry Osborn, <laughs> after he says he's making a shepherd's pie, you hear a knock at the door. And you have uh, <laughs> Harry, Harry Osborn shows up, and he has, like, a little bib on that says, I, I pie. <laughs> I, it's like, I, it's a little slice of pie, and then, like, and then, then pie with that on the shirt. <laughs> oh, no, it's even better. Here, here's how it's even better. It's like uh, breach one of our, uh, is the reference one of our colleagues here. It yes, says, yes. I... Little slice of pie in the shape of it's, it's turned, you know, turned to the turns like the curved parts at the top, so it looks like a sliced heart. Oh my god, I heart and then the symbol for pie. Yes, yes, I oh heart pie. So you gotta you know, remember, uh, James Frank is also an intellectual, he's got a really high IQ. So, you know, I heart pie, <laughs> and he has like a little knife and fork and a plate in hand. It's like, <laughs> did someone say pie? Can I come in, please? Please, wrong franchise. Come on. <laughs> But it's lunch! Oh, God. The looks there. Did somebody say lunch? Is he like a little, is he like a bib, too? <laughs> just saying, I I break for lunch. Meanwhile, Howard Hamlin's just in the corner sipping tea. You know, he's... No, here's, here's the funny thing. Hamlin's oh, at the diner they're all supposed to be at ordinarily. <laughs> it's like, come on! He's like checking his watch. <sighs> Like, okay, us, us and our tangents. Us and our tangents. Anyway, so pie aside, so Alfred's wow. making a shepherd's pie again. All of that for pie. Wow. <laughs> Quote Hugh Neutron, endless pie. <laughs> okay, so Remember, the, folks, uh, all the pie references are on Tiki. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he uh, he basically tells a story to Bruce about how he got the recipe for Shepherd's S- Pie. The from. Sylvia anecdotes. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, Bruce calls him on it. <laughs> You're just telling me a, a, a love story to get me to go with Selena. Well, yes, because it's an opportunity, Master Bruce, and I don't want you to miss the opportunity. Opportunity to get closure. That's exactly what Alfred wants him to get. You should get closure. And Bruce agrees to it if he'll make Alfred stop. And I said, I'll keep the pie warm for you. All right, all right. And by the way, that pie might be an important plot point. I kid you not. (laughs) I believe you. I believe you. Okay, so so, uh, uh, I love how we get the detail on why Bullock's wearing the nice suit. Because he's going to give a nice heartfelt speech to the new cadets at the graduation. Of the Which academy nice. graduation. I like that for both. Both kind of come into this. He was just kind of the you know the the somewhat soiled cop. And now he's like he's kind of the example for the young guys coming into it. Sure, sure. Just nice. Uh, kind of Gordon's influence on Bullock too. But of course, he's just being very boastful about it, and Fox is just like, "How do I look?" look? Gordon has to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite bits. <laughs> is this what oh, Gordon yeah. deals with? <laughs> Constantly, and then a bullet can't find his badge, and it's going to have like a Dark Knight esque payoff. Oh boy, oh boy, yeah, it is. Okay, so, uh, so meanwhile, see, we have uh, chastising... yeah, Penguin's Nigma. chastising Nigma over uh over the chess killer name. <laughs> oh, I'm so terrified of the chess killer. <laughs> uh, the Lord Taylor is so great. It's like a fun new variation on the Penguin. He's had to, we've had a few of them again with all these literary <laughs> references. They have yet sure, another. Sure. It points out that uh, you know, Penguin made again that Penguin made Edward Nigma the man who c- who controlled the city's underworld in plain sight, which was an impressive achievement. See, and importantly, at the moment, Nigma could still go around, still acting upon the mayor's orders, or he can still have some sort of clout in things. So he still has all the power. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Penguin's importantly pointing out this this Riddler, all this kind of these so close to being Riddler crimes. This is madness. And Enigma is arguing, no, it's a way forward. And uh, and your fear confirms it. I like this. This is kind of uh, Enigma kind of confirming that, hey, the fact that you're afraid, it basically he's trying to understand his own psychology here, saying, hey, the fact that you're afraid of this means I'm going somewhere with this. Would you sure? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Penguin warns Enigma. I love this as I go. This is a very accurate warning that Penguin's given him. He warns Enigma. That, you know, you gotta admit that you're, you're lost with, with without Penguin before you destroy everything. Basically, what that means is, you know, he acknowledges that 
if you announce yourself as a villain and a murderer, there's no going back after that. You're going to be, you know, again, your whole, you could have plausible, you, you can fly under the radar right now, the way you stand, but if you go for making yourself a target and everything, you're, you're going to throw all that out the window. There's going to be no going back. Nigma's just kind of shunning that, but then uh, Penguin <laughs> Thanks oh for this one. Oh boy, I don't even know where to start, Dragon. <laughs> oh man, oh, just I, I just love it. It's like we get Robin Lord Taylor just all up and like kind of like a. I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. It's almost kind the of the one like thing a, that Vera Farmiga didn't do in the in the mother uh, persona that would have been right. great. <laughs> yeah, we we never got a song and dance number on Bates Motel, and you know what? That thought kind of came to my mind, Dragon, of like. Man, if only we could have gotten like the musical episode of Bates Motel, like Flash had a musical. Well, episode. we we've truly you're right. Flash did a musical episode, <laughs> and technically Vera Farmiga has sang twice. Well, three oh, that's times. True. That's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> technically but, uh, three. Technically four times. You won't we be haven't had tech. anything like this though. Where like kind no, of no stretches. I, oh man, and it's just great. And like I said, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like Robin Lord Taylor. Like it's kind of like a I. The word that comes to my mind, drag. I have no idea if this is even accurate or not, but is vaudevillian. It's kind of like a vaudevillian getup. Is that is that accurate to you? Well, no. He's in a tuxedo with the top hat. So basically, what he's doing here, he looks yeah, exactly like a like vaudeville the actor, from... like the tux and top hat. That's vaudeville. Sure, I mean, sure. I guess, yeah. It's... It is. Anyway, it was really cool is that he, when he's in the tuxedo with, with the hat, he looks exactly like the Penguin from the comics. Sure, sure, yeah. It's really cool. All he's missing is the umbrella, but again, it looks amazing. Of course, so, um, I love how the sequence, you know, we get kind of like the distorted filter on reality here, so the camera's kind of The like, old film. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> really well done, story. really creative. <laughs> Nigma really needs to lay off those pills. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And all of this is kind of basically the his psyche kind of going overboard and is really distracting Nigma, then admits, you know, okay. I admit, a part of him, a part of me, part of Nigma died, basically he's saying a part of himself died when he killed Penguin. Sure, sure. But he will move forward and be born anew. He's desperate for kind of that, for being born again. He's desperate to kind of be reborn as the Riddler. That's his, that's his destined path, and that's what he's convinced his destined path is. And then, of course, if there's no Edward Nigma without the Penguin, then we get this cool <laughs> shot of Penguin with the, 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 the portrait question mark shot. Yes, yes, that we, uh, you know, that was like kind of one of the big teases going into this episode from, again, Dragon, from January. <laughs> yep. So let's see. Uh, and Lee, okay, and Lee was fine this episode, nothing bad. <laughs> I just have, I just have in my notes, like, Lee's just kind of like putting her head down and, you know, just being very sheepish, just like uh, she's on her best behavior. <laughs> yeah, but I do fear for her this season. There's, there's, there's something in the marketing that's making me a little worried. <laughs> well, anyway, so we have. I mean, as long we as can Gordon enjoy is like off on this Uncle Frank thing, they're not going to be interact. I think Lee is fine until she interacts with Gordon. No, I don't. We'll we'll see. <laughs> we'll get into it later. But let's just say that Lee. Uh, uh, so again, while we can acknowledge it, the wonderful Marina Baccarin. <laughs> right, right. You know, as well, we can say that with certainty. Like, oh yeah, this is like back to kind of good old Marina Baccarin. Yeah. He's showing Fox uh, that Dario, Dario's body, or Dario's body. Darn you pronunciations. It was the guy's body. Uh, and uh, they find, again, kind of like the dark, all of the dark night, and you find yes, a kind of stapled yes. incision on the, on, the guy, on the guy's stomach, and uh, they find uh, a badge in, his, in the belly of the beast. And not only is it a badge, but also while she's doing this, she's mentioning, this is kind of neat. Fox is asking, uh, this is a fun build for the ending, fun foreshadow for the ending, that... Uh, Lucy Fox is asking, "Why would someone do kind of this? You you worked at Arkham Asylum. Why would why do criminal why do insane criminals do this sort of thing?" And Lee's suggesting that you know the, the crimes are a way of of learning about themselves. They're exploring an aspect of their psychology by doing the enacting these crimes. And which is, well done, Lee. Well done. You you contributed to the plot and you uh, shed some insight into the Riddler. Let's let's all give her a golf clap, people. Let's all give her a golf clap. Got like a little little box of gold stars. You know? we got a little box of gold stars and like little stickers. Of gold stars. Not, we don't have that kind of money. So we give her like a little gold star on the white lab on the white lab coat. Lee, you did a good job. You can you can go early for your lunch break. <laughs> Oh god. Okay. All right. So meanwhile, there's a have... free muffin on us. Oh god. 
Meanwhile, we have so, uh, Bullock, uh, Bullock's reciting his speech that he's going to give. Well, the badge was on. Bullock's, by the way. That's why we're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The badge was Bullock's. And uh, I love how the big key part of Bullock's speech is to have plenty of antacids on hand, which Dragon. The prime is... rib speech. No, no, no. I, I, I got to say, I got to say, as someone who suffers from a lot of indigestion and heartburn myself, that, that's really good advice. That is really good advice because heartburn and indigestion can just like put it, put the brakes on your day. So follow Bullock's advice, people. Always have plenty of van acids ready. Anyways, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So then uh, Bullock is unpleasantly surprised by Nigma, you know, because he's there to kind of give a few words, which of course there's no way Bullock's letting, like, letting a cop killer give a speech to impressionable cadets. Sure, sure. So Bullock, uh, Bullock gets a call, and then the Nigma interprets that, okay, that's the call about me, so then he just knocks out Bullock. <laughs> right, right. Meanwhile, Bruce, oh boy, is this is this the scene? It's, oh yes, this is the scene, I gotta talk about it. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Yay! So, Bruce is looking for Selena. Uh, he runs into Sonny Gilzine. Are you really that excited to see Sonny I, Gilzine? <laughs> no, 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 I'm excited for what follows. I'm super okay, excited. Okay, okay. But uh, yeah, we have uh, Sonny Gilzy, who initially in the past that'd been a little iffy on Sonny Gilzy because they had that really forced like Joker laugh scene, which uh, we oh had god, that. right, right, I forgot about that. That was back because we love the idea of the oh, multiple man. kind of the Joker like character. <laughs> still, Sonny was always pushing it. Was like he's laughing. So he calls him like a, a brutish. Yeah, he that, calls him a brutish that clown. That we had that's like the four. That was the most forced Joker esque character. Yeah, had. yeah, right. <laughs> so this like now it seems like they moved past it. So at least I'm excited. I just, I just love the idea that, that Gilzine has a nephew, Sonny Gilzine. It's, it's so ridiculous and funny. <laughs> Sonny Gilzine, ridiculous. Anyway, so Selena, uh, you know, Gilzine's about to mix up with Bruce because last time Bruce kind of got the upper hand. He beat him up as a dude and got really got into it. That was a cool moment. So listen, you know, Bruce kind of. You know, punch that, that guy in the face. Anyway, so Selena, uh, Selena stops the altercation. You know, she uh, she's still not pleased with Bruce, which I will say, as much as I do love what follows in the scene, eh, it's kind of took a little bit out of it. Come on, Selena. Again, in these weeks that have followed, you still have to Yeah, me. yeah, right, right. That will say. Again, sounds, again it, I think it's just more of a kind of the writers kind of wrote themselves into a corner with the weeks of past thing, I think. No, but honestly, there's just still something towards the end we really weren't crazy about this whole, like, uh, Selena just, she, it's kind of a, Bruce was screwed either way. He, he didn't tell her the fact that her mother was a con artist, but, yeah, the fact that her mother was conning her, and just, it's still, he did that to spare her feelings. He did something nice for you, Selena. I know it's not like, you know, again, it's kind of, it's an unhappy truth, but you don't have to still hold a grudge against them. Sure, sure. I'm not saying I think she'd be a little bit more past it by now, but I don't know. So uh, she has business with Sonny, and that's, of course, why Sonny Gilzine is in the scene. Uh, she tells Bruce to go home, and before she goes, Bruce asks her, well, look, if you want, if you don't want me here, why'd you send me a note? And I called this, by the way. I called this. I knew this note was a trap. <laughs> Very <laughs> smart. I knew something's off here. <laughs> so she says, uh, well, I would send you a note. And, of course, it indicates that Bruce, okay, something's up here. And uh, then we have, first of all, this really cool moment followed by one of my favorite parts of the episode. So... Uh, uh, Bruce says, uh, uh, you know, Sonny Gilzine's up, oh, shame your girlfriend's gone. And uh, Bruce says, this fun lies is, I don't think she's my girlfriend. <laughs> Gilzine. Sonny like the, he's like, yeah, I don't either. <laughs> I just like that kind of casualty before battle, by the way. Just that little, like, uh, little happy-go-lucky bit before, you know sure, what? Sure. Yeah, she's not. <laughs> and then, of course, back to the money. You know, he's, he's basically trying to mug Bruce, so we know we get this, but oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, I love this part. <laughs> so, uh, this wonderfully shot and shadowed Bruce Wayne fight scene. Like, oh, God, it was so It doesn't awesome. quite reach the heights of, like, let's say, like a Daredevil hallway fight, but it's definitely better than anything we see in Iron Fist. Come on, don't. You're just jumping on the bandwagon for that. I, to be fair, I, ha I still haven't seen That's it. That's what I'm saying. You don't say that. You haven't. <laughs> you're, you're, just, you're just jumping on the bandwagon for that. <laughs> anyways, anyways. Oh, it's one just shame. Life. Oh, twins of shame. Twins of shame. Okay. Twins of shame. But the point is, the point is, I'm just, I'm trying to make an accurate comparison here, all right? I'm just saying it's, I don't think that, I agree with you, it's a very well shot action scene. I don't think it quite measured up to the heights of a Daredevil hallway fight, but I think it is very good. I like how they use the, uh, kind of the pseudo silhouette look in the fight scene. Yeah. Again, it's kind of it takes them back to kind of the opening of the animated series. We're in shadow. Oh, yeah, yeah, 
you know, those kind of, yeah, we kind of shoot far away. He's in shadow. He has kind of the long coat on, so it's kind of cape-like. It's really neat. And, uh, of course, Bruce at this point is very well trained by Alfred. And he's, he's, he, we see how far he's come along. He's, he's much more skilled yeah, than Yeah, you know what? I, I, I will admit the whole, like, Bruce being trained thing was is something that surprisingly paid off very well throughout the seasons. Yeah, because uh, he took one hit, but then that was just the introductory, because mm -hmm. we took more Batman against Tree Thugs won't be taking any. It's like, you know, unless they're like, really, unless he's really off his game. So, you know, he t takes one hit, but then he doesn't take a second hit. He, just, he takes him down. He elbows he elbows Sonny, and then he's, he's punching the rest of him. And again, in silhouette, it looks, in shadow, it looks great. It's a really cool scene. I was like pumping my fist in the air. Yeah, that's my guy. That's, that's, that's <laughs> the man who will be Bat. Yes. Oh, okay. I was... I really love that part. So, All right. so uh, we have Nigma. He's kind of in the full Riddler like suit at this point, which is very well. Cool. Not the full Riddler suit. That's you're right. You're right. They keep building it. They keep building it. But he is uh, it's like eighty percent Riddler. Green. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said uh, he's kind of like making an obvious like, oh, Captain Bullock's tied up at the moment. Wink. wink. Which is funny. <laughs> Uh, right, so, so it's really cool that right here, this is sort of his, before he has a name, this is his villain introductions. He's making a grand entrance of a supervillain. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, you know, he questioned, he riddles the cadets, uh, which goes like? Light as a feather, yet no man can hold it long. Uh, and uh, I love this. He has fun little lines. Of, oh, no future commissioners here. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Why do, I, I just might have enjoyed that more than others, but yeah, it was kind of a cute line. I like that. Uh, then uh, he uh, he throws like a little uh, a gas bomb at him. He had a few mm -hmm. kind of gas canisters at him, and uh, your breath. Answer to the rule. So, the Lucius. Oh, God. <laughs> he runs his, <laughs> oh, you God. know. Again, an average an average Thursday for the life of a GCPD person. i uh, just running into a strawberry. <laughs> I just, just love that. The minute he walked in, I guess that's for me. <laughs> Which you're right, Dragon. This is very much like the Hey Arnold thing. <laughs> yeah, that way, <Wayne> Gerald. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> she stole Gerald's costume. <laughs> well, to be fair, they did ditch the costumes in the dumpster. I think. Right. All right. <laughs> True. That lady's been dumpster done. Oh, well, more specifically, whatever her uh, her messenger company has been searching for the they've, been, they've been shopping at a discount. Okay, so I I love this kind of like dark sixties Batman trap here, Dragon. Uh, Harvey. Oh, by the way, yeah. Tell me, you caught this? We had the sixties ringtone. I did not catch that, no. Well, it was awesome. What they did is, for the for Riddler's ringtone, this is great, the, the Riddler of all characters, they had the transition, you da 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 Oh, okay. okay. That was his ringtone. It was the, it was like the, da 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 <laughs> Okay, so uh, I really like this, uh, this trap. And I like how it's not necessarily a death trap, but it kind of just plays on your psychological fears. Like, it looks about, like, five stories up or so on a staircase. And he's yeah. being dangled over uh, on a chair, and it's like I like how it's like if he falls, like he's not necessarily going to die, but it's going to be very painful. And it's just the dangling over the edge that is more the torture more than anything else. They think it's a very clever death trap in that way. Well, here's here's the parameters. Here's here's mm -hmm. essentially what's being said. So again, so you know, he, they realize you know, Fox knows on the phone that it's new because who else calls me Foxy? And Enigma. Basically, Enigma says he's poisoned. He says he claims that he's poisoned the room full of cadets, and around Bullock's neck is is the antidote. And uh, essentially, the you know he wants him to play his old game, and he goes to the stairwell. Which, by the way, I love the I love the 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 location of the stairwell because I love that we can have Enigma on a higher level, and we could have Fox like right above him on like one level lower. It's a great state, right? Great, right. Great yeah, yeah, you're right. For all this stuff to go down on. Uh, let's see. So then, uh, essentially, the rules are very simple. It's basically uh, three. Uh, Three ropes, three riddles. Mm -hmm. Three ropes, three riddles. You get at least one right, you win. Can't get any fairer than that, as <laughs> as he says. Basically, you get one right, you still pass. So again, it's the ultimate kind of kind of fair thing. And as we're going to find out later on, the reason uh, you know he's not entirely you know, the reason it's why it's not like an instant death for Bullock is he's not exactly trying to. Uh, believe me, it, I still think Bullock would die if he fell. It. Like, it's not a guarantee. It's most likely commodity. Probably, I don't right? want to argue the semantics of it, but like yeah. I said, I. Can you agree that I you like the psychology of like having him dangled over and like playing on Bullock's fear of heights? I thought that was kind of clever. 
true. Let's see. So uh, yeah, you're right. That's good. It's kind of like the the kick. I love how it looks. Though. I just love how we have Bullock kind of teetering this whole scene, panicking as as you know, Lucius from tells him to remove the, the uh, <laughs> right, right. The tape. So Bullock, after every rope is cut, he's just he's panicking, saying this, one, this wonderful, fearful gibberish. Oh God! Well, not gibberish, but he was just saying these wonderfully kind of fearful. Oh God! I got to go. <laughs> so it was so so terrifying. It's kind of like it's like the kick from Inception. You know, like that that sense of falling when you like it is. Yeah, like you're right. Off, you're right. Yeah, my like two legs are off the ground. That sort of feel. But you're, it's like a greater fall. Okay. So, so uh, riddle yeah, number yeah. one. Uh, I can fill a room or just one heart. Others have me, but I cannot be shared. Duh. So, so here's the here's. I'm sorry. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. So yes, the uh, the uh, the answer. Now here's the interesting part. I want to analyze this for a moment. Is that all of these answers, by the way, are kind of tied into a theme, possibly, which I'll get to at the very end after we go through all three. But uh, the first, the answer, to the first one, Fox says love, which I believe is the correct answer. I couldn't find this one. The answer to this one, I was trying to double check, and this one I could not find. But I believe love was the actual answer. The the answer that Nigma wants that yeah. he's looking for is lonely. Yeah, he says loneliness, which I still don't think makes sense. But uh, you know, loneliness filling a room. But I don't know. I think it means lonely. But that, 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 that doesn't matter quite. So I, I still think like he's just the the way uh, Chris Chalk, the actor, portrays Lucius. Like, the way he looks like kind of side like, I think he knows I got that one right. What am I dealing with here? Sure, sure. I don't know because I think again because then Nigma's baffled how how Fox will get that wrong. So I don't know. That one's that one's kind of one to read into, I guess. But if you folks out there can find the answer, I'm like, kind of give us the official ruling, it'd be appreciated. But uh, either way, loneliness, love, it might be one of kind of what we run into with the second row, which goes with something like, uh, I can be a member of a group but can never blend in. Which uh, Lucius's answer is snowflake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nigma's answer of choice is individual, and I love that Fox argues that you know Snowflake is an acceptable answer because the answer is also individual. Well, of course, uh, is... let's just point out Corey Michael Smith just absolutely going out of his way, just pissed as hell. Like you know, like we're talking like we're talking like blood vein on his forehead, just like no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the way he just like yells no. <laughs> and then then Bulk says some of You have to give before. my answer. Yeah, because you don't. I don't think you don't understand the rules here. You know, they basically Nigma. Nigma makes rules. You have to guess my answer. So then uh, he cuts the second row, much the bullocks. Yeah, fear. He says, "Oh, mama, oh, I'm God. sorry. I'm, oh, mama, I'm sorry. Oh, God." <laughs> Somebody starts with, "Oh, mama." <laughs> oh, God. Kind of like a Johnny Bravo kind of fear before. He, it's kind of like. John Bravo exclaiming and playing. Anyway, so number uh, real uh, okay before rule number three, he starts to lose his cool. He's starting to doubt himself, and in a way, he's thinking that Penguin may have been right that uh, you know, this is not not the way to go down. You know, he's pointing a gun at Fox's head. Uh, he uh, then composes himself, and of course, he reminds himself of the rules three riddles mm -hmm. before he makes any rash decisions. So we get a riddle three. I feel your every move. I know your every thought. I'll be with you. I've been with you since birth, and I'll be there till you rot, which is a repeat of the one we got before. Yes, yeah, so all, all these are, because he's asking the same uh, three rules to the smartest minds in God. Right, right, right. Okay. So let's see. So Fox, I believe before he gives the correct answer, he uh, points out the... He's asking about the penguin, because it's the way Nygma's talking sounds like he killed the penguin, which is news the book as well. So they're kind of learning, like, oh boy, that's not good. Mm -hmm. So Nigma then repeats the riddle, and Fox gives the correct answer. Reflection, which initially Bullock, they play really tense, like you know, again, because <laughs> why I, does I think it always that... have to be three answers? Why can't it be four? Come on! <laughs> which is funny. Again, I, I do like the tension here because you're not sure again with that for the way those first two riddles go. You don't know, like how on the money Nigma's being with them. Sure, sure. So, uh, right, and so correct, and then. Uh, because there's only one rope holding bullet, it's like the one to the very left. Like it's like not even holding the middle. Right, right. Uh, it, it snaps, and Enigma goes, oops, because again, he's learning. He's, he's just starting out. Uh, now, here's here's a problem I have with the episode here. One, it's really convenient that Bullock was so easily saved by Lucius. Yeah, I agree. I it's basically, agree. Bullock I mean, falls. I'm not going to like lose any sleep over it, but I was kind of like, yeah, that's, that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah, I'm just saying with... 
yeah, part of me I want to. I just want to write it off because it, like, it's learning curve for Enigma, so it's like he can make some mistakes like that. And we, as we learn later on, his his priority is not killing people. It's it's uh, you know finding someone and and challenging Fox. Those are the priorities. The priority is not killing cops. Uh, so it's it's debatably how how much he wanted Bullock dead, but it's it, it it's kind of hard to tell. But the fact is, like he just falls from one flight. And just Lucius Fox, thankfully, has been at the gym lately, working at the gym lately. So he just, he's able to pull. He was able to catch Bullock and pull him up in a chair from one flight down. He had to act really fast, so it's I don't know, bit of a buy for me. Thank you. So, uh, so let me let me let me mention this before we move on. So, with all the riddles, uh, I love thematically all the riddle, all of those three riddles. They are all about identity. You know, I I can let's let's assume the first one's love. Uh, even if the other one's like loneliness, it still fits what I'm going for here. Is that love or loneliness, followed by uh, individual followed by reflection. Those are the three answers. So what they mm-hmm. connect to in terms of theme for Riddler, uh, Riddler's arc, in fact, a lost love, which would either, you know, again, be about love or be about him being lonely after losing that love. Uh, moving forward, which, of course, is being individual, you individualize yourself from the Penguin. And then lastly, finding a new match, finding a new mentor, finding your, your enemy. Right, right. Reflection. Someone who reflects you, reflects your intelligence. So I'm saying I, I like that all the rules were not only just like to, to trick people up, they were to find the ultimate enemy or kind of find the ultimate mind. That's kind of like Nigma's own sort of like psychology coming out within the answers. Yeah, it's bit. like again, which is what Lee kind of told, told us. Sure, sure. Okay, meanwhile. Ah, uh, yes. So, <laughs> Bruce. Okay, so, uh, yeah, Bruce comes upon Doppel Bruce in the alley. He was just kind of wiping some blood. Away. Speaking of reflection, he's he's walking down the alley. He's right, he's, uh, right. he's uh, finally he's bleeding from that one hit he took in the Gilzine and the Gilzine debacle. So he's uh, wiping the blood from his face, and uh, in the broken mirror, we have uh, Doppel Bruce revealed, which of course the theme of reflection again, kind of Bruce. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The dark reflection of Bruce Wayne, and kind of the reflection that Nigma has been looking for the episode. Uh, we have the. I love this Doppel Bruce's theme. I love it. It sounds directly like a Danny Elfman cue. It sounds. Like <laughs> You're right. It kind of does. It yeah. sounds exactly like a like a cue. F- it sounds like honestly, it sounds kind of like the Catwoman cue from uh, from Batman Returns. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> also, kind of Men in Black too, if you want to be specific. But uh, anyway, so uh, of course he's dressed like Bruce, and he it's a Bruce. Sorry, Bruce says the Doppel Bruce, and you sent the note, didn't you? Right, right. So you end up with Bruce is here to replace, and that's why he's dressed exactly like him. And then we have this line, this line. Oh, Tiki, I'm so happy with this line because it feels directly pulled from the book. Uh, yes. It's like looking into a mirror, which, of course, is like, yeah, Bruce, this is the other side of the mirror when he slams him right into the building, remember? Sure, sure. Yes. You know, basically, some big big calls from our Doppel Bruce in Court of Owls does a lot of this stuff to Bruce. It's like fun little pulls from the book here and there. He then, after he says that, he injects Bruce with the serum, you know, the knockout serum that Catherine was preparing earlier on. Uh, this is what I was made for. And I love the way David Mazou says that. <laughs> and then the yeah. Doppel Bruce said, and the idea of Doppel Bruce has found his purpose with the Court of Owls, again, directly mobbed after Court of Owls with the, the Lincoln March character. Sure, sure. Uh, t- again, to be to be Bruce Wayne, he says. That's good stuff. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see. Gordon's kind of grilling Uncle Frank about uh, about the lies and whatnot. Yeah, like you know, he's questioning how. Like, how is all this possibly in the court? Like, you know, why now? Uh, uh-huh. Uh, uh, Frank says, you know, the court lied to he and his brother. Uh, Frank believed in the, in the court's principles, which, again, initially founded on good things. Uh, you got to assume that's the core of Al's induction thing. Yeah, we believe on these, these founded which I, principles. I think it's a really interesting concept that kind of fits in line with Gordon and kind of the life he leads and the, uh, you know, sort of the thin line that gets drawn with being commissioner in Gotham. You know what I mean? And you got to remember, it does make sense that, just yeah, so people, if there's anyone out there who's like kind of arguing conveniency for why Gordon's wrapped up in this, let's let's remember. Uh, this this also kind of goes in the comic that, uh, again, we still know nothing about Gordon's father in the comic, but uh, Gordon's name was in the Court of Owls book. So it's, I believe, mm. if I'm right, Gordon's heritage, like his family has also been kind of like a lineage of policemen or been involved in law in some way. Right. And and here specifically in the Gotham universe, we've established that you know, Gordon's father was a prominent attorney, and it's kind of like you get a sense that okay, like a prominent law by law involved family in Gotham would be a target for the Court of L. So we get kind of the, the head DA of Gotham and his brother involved in this, and then go down to Gordon the the, uh, the 
detective on a path to maybe become commissioner one day. So uh, Frank believed in the course principles. He now despises them with every bone in his body. Uh, Peter changed Frank's mind. Peter's the reason that, uh, that Frank turned against the court of Owls because Frank, uh, Peter saw through the lies of the court. He saw the heresy and what they were doing, which of course lines up with what Gordon really admires about his father, kind of the, kind of the commissioner Gordon, like not wavering in, in the face of corruption mentality, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, and, uh, Frank feels guilty that he didn't listen to Peter until it was too late, until Peter was murdered by the court, which is and a I big how, reveal. Uh, yeah, I love how Gordon is like, wait, no, I, I was in the car. I watched my father die. That's impossible. It's kind of like the Winter Soldier reveal from uh, from Civil War. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. I'm just saying it's more like I should say Winter Soldier because we didn't know the specifics of it until, uh, until Civil War. But, you know, the fact that Winter Soldier was involved in the murder of, of the Starks, mm -hmm. you know, that's something we kind of knew in uh, the Winter Soldier. It's kind of like that, like that big reveal of, oh, yeah, we're, we're seeing, we knew the Starks died in, in the cars. We didn't know it was like the work of Hydra. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> right, right. So, again, that's uh, they, they orchestrated the car accident, which is a really cool idea, I got to tell you. That, that yeah, it's years. like, especially because car wrecks are just, uh, they're simple, you know what I mean? They're clean, they're efficient. Uh, Folks, watch with the weapon. You'll see a similar kind of method. Yeah, it's essentially like you know, just a good way to put someone off the map without drawing suspicion of foul play. Yeah, and again, it's so traumatic because like Gordon, I love this idea, and this to me feels so Scott Snyderian, so Scott Snyder like. I, don't know, I, don't <laughs> I keep trying to say Snyderian. I don't know <laughs> the point is, it feels so Scott Snyder like because it, it's like kind of the, these are like the creepy ideas Snyder loves to work with. Like usually with Bruce Wayne, it's kind of Bruce Wayne's arc and core of Al's through Gordon here is that uh, something that was right under his nose and he never noticed. Like Gordon was in the car when his father died. He had no right, idea right. That he was work of something big or something else. And it's basically the idea that now Gordon is going through, Bruce Wayne has gone through in, in the seasons of Gotham. Now he's found that his his father, his, his father was murdered, like the Waynes were murdered by the same person, by the same people, in fact. Mm -hmm. Remember, the court's, the court's responsible for the murder of the Waynes, and now the, the court's also responsible for the murder of, of Gordon's father. So again, they I have that much... I'm in, convinced that the writers have this like planned out all along, but you're right, like getting to that point is a pretty satisfying arc. Well, the, the Gordon idea, I, I'll bet you, was not from the very start, but uh, <laughs> right. the Court of could have... Now, to, an argument... I don't know how far ahead they planned it, but the Court of Owls thing could have been planned from the start, feasibly. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, so let's see. So, uh, again, Gordon's questioning a lot, again, questioning the suspiciousness of this thing. 20 years later, you come back now. Where were you when my mother and I needed you? Mm -hmm. You know, he says, I had no choice. I was sent overseas <laughs> to, uh, to test uh, the test, uh, test is loyalty. You know, why would you stay with the court of owls? And he basically, he was in a like, life or death situation. He chose to live. Uh, why risk it now? Why risk coming to me with this now? Uh, and he says, well, they want you now, Jim, which means, you know, I'm not alone in this, which means I could, I could have someone else on the inside. You can help me destroy them from within, which essentially was kind of, again, this question is kind of the character of Frank a little bit because, yeah, we're, like, Darth Vader had the same offer for Luke Skywalker in Return of the Jedi. Hey, yeah, but I, I do like how they're I do like how they're playing with us here with Frank, where yeah. even by the end of the episode, we're still not entirely sure how he's leaning. True, so I think it's again, interesting. It's, yeah, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, we can destroy him from within. You know, we can bring democracy and law back to back to Gotham, which is a cool offer, which, uh, yeah, which is, it's, yeah. a, it's a cool notion. You know, why, and then Jim's saying, why should I trust you? Because we're family, and kind of throwing his own words back in his face. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Frank says, we ha we all have to believe in something, saying, what choice do you have? you want to live in a, in a world where you know this exists and you did nothing? The centuries, please. Sure, sure. And then, uh, last notion I'll say here before we move on, uh, so again, Jim, I love that, again, another Snyder idea here is that Jim's intrigued by the idea of ridding Gotham. I, I think Jim's intrigued by the idea of ridding Gotham of the root of, of major corruption in the city and avenging his, the, his father's death, like Bruce. Mm -hmm. Like Bruce has been, has been trying to do. Again, kind of another strong connection via the Court of Owls, the two of them. Sure. But you see what I mean? There's, you know, Gordon's definitely intrigued. He would definitely be at, uh, he'd probably be joining Frank for the, for the grand scheme of helping Gotham. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And of course, Gordon, like, he is kind of in a crossroads now where, you know, of course, we infamously joked about him not being a part of the GCPD, and he was reluctant to come back to the GCPD. So there is that whole kind of dangling thread where his loyalty to them is kind of, you know, he he, he really is kind of a nomad at this point. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, Alfred. 
Okay, so uh, I, I, we get the clever exposition through the radio that the Riddler's been missing still, and uh, you oh, know the that man Nick in was, the green suit. Yeah, that's the name on the radio. The man in the green suit. Right, right. And uh, oh god, here we go with Doppel Bruce. This is this is really fun. So Doppel Bruce is very chipper to see Alfred. You know, then, um, Alfred's just like my my master Bruce. You look very chipper. I, I assume things went well with Selena. The dragon. I, I'll, I'll wager this might be the funniest uh, David Mizzou delivery we've ever seen on the show. He's just like Selena, Selena. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I, I'm like the way I say it doesn't do it justice. It's like he's so blasé about it. <laughs> but I, I think it's I think it's far more convincing than he was uh, before when he was pretending to be Bruce Wayne. Yeah, I think so too. He's a little too Selena, chipper, Selena. but yeah, he's a little you know he's a little. I mean, more I still kind of think like... it's it's chipper enough that I think Alfred's going to suspect yeah. something's up. But it's still, yeah, it's. It's, it's kind of the leave it to be for like happy go lucky person, you know. It's like, <laughs> Ooh, oh my pie sounds delicious. So that's what I think. Now here's my plot point here. Is I was about here. I think oh. the pie tips Alfred off because there's a little music cue that plays. <laughs> I'm serious. When I watched it twice now, and this this happened the second time too. It's like when the pie is mentioned. I knew I knew I heard this the first time. When the pie is mentioned, there's a little dramatic music cue play that plays like a little twinge of like oh. oh. Uh, and I'm convinced that I'm still convinced that Alfred, like, because Bruce wasn't thrilled about the pie. He says, "Well, I, you know, Master right, Bruce, if you, right. I, I, I'm really hoping that Alfred's like pretend playing along with this with Doppel Bruce because he knows the pie gave it away." That's that's nice. I I, I hope I hope that's uh, that's correct, Dragon. That'd be really clever on your part. At the very that'd least, I want him to be suspicious after that. Right, okay, right. I want him to, <laughs> it's at the least like okay, something's up with this kid. You know, I want to take I don't want to take it so long as it did with uh, with you know our, our Clay Gordon, with, 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 you know with, with oh, Clay God. Gordon. Uh, right. Right. Right, <laughs> you know, eating the snacks. And As the we couch. established in that episode, that was just like a lot of fun, but it was at the expense of other characters' intelligence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least Bullock was catching on to it, but it took him way too long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. let's see. So, uh, following uh, following Pi, okay. yes, yes. Uh, the Strike Force search in the mansion. No luck. Find the question mark portrait. Mm-hmm. Then Lucius, uh, yeah. Uh, Nigma is in the car with Lucius, kind of corners Lucius to the car. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's see, let's see. Lucius is questioning Enigma's motive because he mentions, you know, we did the test. You know, the antidote uh, in the vial was grape juice and everyone was used, had knockout gas instead of oh. this poison you were talking about. So the point, and he mentioned the point was not to kill cops, the point was to, to play games, to get you to play my game. Tell me, have you always been this foxy? Foxy. <laughs> I really do uh, really like the line because he's saying, then why kill people? He's asking, he kind of poses a riddle, a question instead of an answer. He, says, he, does, ever, he does, yeah. <laughs> have you always been Foxy, Foxy? Have you, ever, have you always been who you are now, essentially, is what he's asking. So, uh, and then Nigma's kind of going to Baxter again. Really well written uh, scene here until the very end, I thought. Okay. okay. Uh, basically, goes into it saying, I've always been someone straight i've always wanted in deep down i've always been someone stronger and smarter there's always been someone stronger and smarter inside and mm. essentially only the penguin saw that only yes only oswald saw that so why'd you kill him he killed the they killed the woman i loved you know, he killed isabella not isabel isabella <laughs> he killed uh he killed the woman i loved uh and uh and then uh, fox is pointed so i'm his replacement a reflection no I know who I am. I need to know how to be that. You helped me. Thank you. Again, Gunda Lucia says, and okay, well, now you thank you know, you've with your usefulness. Bang. It's about it's about to be what happens. And I love this. This to me, I, the bit of this scene, I really love what it does here. So Fox tries to reach Nigma on a intellectual and a human level, which is really clever, really great. And again, I love that we built this where Lee kind of telling a little bit about psychology in the beginning, and now this is really coming out. He's the only person who could possibly get to Nigma on this level, on the intellectual level, be someone who has matched him intellectually in some capacity in this episode, which, of course, would only be Fox. Sure. So, you know, he's mentioned, uh, he's, he confronts him with the intellectual, logical facts, the things that Penguin's been confronting with here and there on, on the grand scheme, like becoming a villain. So Lucius is addressing it here to him. Uh, you killed six, technically seven, if you count the Penguin, six to seven people. You know, uh, you and announced you're a villain and a murderer to the world. If there's any part of you that is not insane, listen to me. You need help. Turn yourself in. 
And then, uh, then Enigma is saying, my actions seem mad to you, don't they? Yes, they do to anyone. Mm. Enigma in this moment realizes that the you know, penguin was was right about uh, about facing the truth. That that's kind of what Fox and I love how Fox is ushering him into this this point. He, Fox is is allowing him to move forward. So Fox is filling that 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 role that he Enigma needed him to fill all along, even though he's trying not to. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> you know, Nigma's realizing I killed my best friend. All of this uh, was was Nigma. All the stuff he's done in the episode was basically Nigma desperately holding on to Penguin as long as he could, just a little bit longer, trying to find a someone to fill the Penguin shoes. <laughs> so, uh, so in a way, it's just kind of like the most the most uh, destructive, demented casting call ever. Yeah, and just form of therapy also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then here's the bit I I love the whole scene. I love this scene. I love how it's written, except okay. for this last bit, and it's kind of crucial to the episode. At least the title Where he says the name. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. The version of the name. Yeah, uh, like for an episode called "How the Riddler Got His Name," I don't necessarily I mean, think there's a huge amount of build up to it in the episode. I, I love the how, but it's the name parts. With I love everything else, like how he got to that point. That's great. Uh -huh. like right, the right. Name. The, I, I, goodness, could have written so many other different ways, like how he got the name. Like it, it, look at Batman Forever, for example. It's not I rarely would say on this show, but look at Batman Forever. For example. <laughs> The, you know the whole like you know the, he's going through all the the funny names you know the puzzler the, the, the sure the, sure the riddler you know kind of he happens upon this so who are you uh, Lucius questions who are you now he says oh and this like a good cool build up for it but again not founded on anything really he says oh come on Foxy I'm the Riddler knocks him out -ha 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 -ha. <laughs> again just I'm I'm the Riddler uh, well again where did it come from where did riddle I mean, yeah, you know you're it, it's just a little anticlimactic for me, especially because the whole episode yeah. is supposed to be based on this. You know what I mean? Yeah, which ordinarily, Goth uh, Gotham titles don't always hold the meaning they should. Oh, God. Course, oh, my God. Yeah. We're going back to that. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Oh, I'm no. <laughs> this is like the very long-winded version of, like, Selena Kyle or Harvey Dent. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. See, that's kind you're of right. the... Uh... You're right, Dragon. I did. Oh, man. You're so right. <laughs> but you see what I mean, though, right? I mean, yes, Gotham is I, I totally see friend. what you mean. It's like, oh, God. It's like this whole episode. Is, it's like how the Riddler got his name. And it's like... It's it's really just like a, a vague afterthought in the grand scheme of things. Oh, that's a good point. Oh man, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, I get like, well, then it's like, well, usually sometimes the Gotham titles don't really. The name's usually not a pivotal point because they just kind of forget it. But it's an afterthought, for us. <laughs> right? Right. But uh, in this case, it sounds like it's based on the episode's really about the, about the formation of the Riddler. That's kind of important. So you want to get the name part right in this case. <laughs> Anyway, so I knocks out Lucius. Uh, he uh, again. I, I just wish the the name came about differently. That's really all I can say. Yeah. Uh, oh, so uh, let me say, let me mention this before we move on. This is connects to the gives in the next series that I love. Uh, tell me if this sounds a little cr uh, crazy to you, but I this to me feels like a, a killing joke moment for for the Riddler. Does it? Somewhat of a killing joke moment between Nigma and Fox. You know, it's. It's somewhat kind of that moment with Batman and Joker in the rain where he's like saying, again, oh, it's a really nice, tender scene, the two of them in the car. It's like Lucius reaching him on that human level saying, hey, this doesn't make any sense. You're the, you're the smartest man in Gotham. Why are you doing this? You know, you need help. Turn yourself in. He's giving like a genuine human chance. It's kind of the moment with Batman and Joker where it's, yeah, uh, right, you know, right. saying like, you know, look. We don't. We don't have to fight. I mean, of course, just, it doesn't have like the decades of, of course, build up to it. It yeah. doesn't. But I'm saying you don't want it to be just the carbon copy. I'm saying this feels like an original take on that, but for the Riddler. I can see that. Sure. I'm saying I kind of like that aspect of it. On the rewatch, I kind of picked them. Oh my god, it's kind of like a killing joke for the Riddler. It's kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, then we get the uh, <laughs> this is the fun reoccurring symbol in Gotham. I must say, <laughs> the, the pier on the on the outskirts next to the I think this is technically it's a different location, but essentially they're going for the same visual idea. Uh, right, right. Here, let's say, is the symbol of change in Gotham. It's always the, the symbol of kind of being near the outside, the entry point of the city, the entry point, the exit point of the city. Where Enigma, in the end of that weird break for the season, <laughs> uh, Enigma <sighs> was in the position of, of Jim Gordon at the beginning of Gotham, where, you know, what if Jim did shoot the penguin? That's what Enigma's been living through, the dark evolution versus the, the, the troubled evolution. That Gordon went through. So Enigma's been through like, what if you know, Gordon did kill the Penguin? Mm -hmm. you know, who would you know who who will he become? That's kind of what 
it's kind of what it had an old penguins line of like i'm not really a fan of the view <laughs> <laughs> you can understand again, why yeah not only just that because of the fact that he was killed in this exact spot <laughs> Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, just saying, you know, I love that you know, we've had all these you know, Ivy kind of leaving and re-entering the city through this point. Sure, you know, sure. I, I, I really truly do love this idea of again. This spot does have a lot of meaning in the series of Gotham. That's it. everyone says. Even if the pilot did well, and that scene at the dock always did really get him to watch the next one. So uh, this this, this location is always kind of important. I really I always loved it for that reason. So the uh, what's happening in the scene. So the reason they're there. Uh, again, point of change, point of evolution is. Uh, Enigma makes peace with Penguin. He's, he's moving forward. He's kind of doing, uh, let's just say, uh, uh, a way Bates Motel could have ended. Uh, here. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, right, Enigma yeah. is uh, one of one of the various, because I had a whole lot of, uh, a few different theories of how Bates Motel could have ended. It kind of is one of the, this is like one of the ways it could have ended. Uh, Enigma making peace with Penguin, acknowledging that, yes, I do, I, I did care about you, and I'm, uh, and I do miss you. And he dumps the pills, uh, the uh, well before he dumps the pills, you know, it's, it's the logic of Penguin is deflating the the meaningfulness of the moment, saying, "Well, he re- he's reminding that well that that that's nice, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm dead." Uh, he also reminds him that he's that he's wanted, and uh, no one's going to fear the Riddler. Let me get this great line. Not yet, but they will be. Which I, I think is probably the payoff for the name that the episode was probably going for. Yeah, again, that's that's what. That, <laughs> If we just could have worked in the name in that scene, yeah. that would all the better. Yeah. If you came up with the name with with Riddler. And now Dragon, uh, you know, until until two minutes later in the episode, or actually only like uh, literally like the next scene, literally the next scene. I don't know. Do you think it would have been more effective if we had if we would have had at least like one scene between like you know Ed tosses the pills and we don't see uh, Penguin and maybe it's like oh okay is that like. Robin Moore Taylor's swan, swan song on the show. Nope. <laughs> well, I I know what they're. I think I know what they're going for here. So it's it's kind of like again, as one is doing this, then we have the re, the harsh reality setting in on, on the other. But you're right, though. Of kind of a, you're right, though. It is kind of a beautiful swan song in some way. Again, like they kind of pull two swan songs out of their like, head. Like if I were row. them, I'd maybe like swap the stuff with uh, you know, with Jim and Frank. Like this is just a real nitpick, you know, like. Where, uh, you know, like Gordon finds a picture and Frank with a core. I would switch that and then have the Oswald stuff or maybe have the Oswald stuff right at the end. I don't know. I, I'm just saying, like, at least give us some time to process that Robin Lord Taylor maybe might not be on the show anymore. Maybe. <laughs> That's, I mean, that, I, I see I see your point, but I kind of like the juxtaposition, I guess. But, yeah, you're right, though. It is kind of like it would be nice to kind of absorb it. For, for, for what it is. Right, it dumps, right. Dumps the pills. We hear kind of the somber Penguin theme playing as he dumps the pills, and that's kind of our goodbye, Penguin. And then he... Uh, then he Goodbye, Oswald. He walks. He dons the hat and he walks away, mm-hmm. accepting his destiny as the Riddler. And then we have the uh, the harsh reality that uh, <laughs> I knew this was coming. I knew. I think. Yeah. You, you had, I told you. Unfortunately, it didn't play out the way I wanted it to either. But uh, I, I was still hoping the Court of Owls was going to be responsible for this. Right. Right. Because again, they said they had plans for him. I wanted to know what those plans were. Darn it. <laughs> but uh, so then we we reveal, of course, big surprise. Robin Lord Taylor, one of the most popular characters on the show, <laughs> is not dead. <laughs> uh, so Penguin, uh, it's revealed that Penguin is in fact alive. He's wounded, and he's been he's been nursing his uh, nursing wounds in the weeks that have eluded week. us. Yes, yes. Uh, it is uh, revealed that uh, Ivy has been, as for some mysterious reason, rescued the penguin. Uh, no clue why. Uh, what are you, you ever, Are you stupid? I like how she's just like she's just like she's just insulted by the fact that he doesn't know her name. Like she thinks she's some big shot. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I think it's honestly. Uh, I think the only reason I can think of why she saved him is because she like she realized, oh man, the mayor. May, it, it's I just saved. Oh, the mayor. I absolutely think it's because yeah, like I, I'm gonna I'm gonna nurse the mayor back to health, and then that'll be a benefit to me. I, I definitely think that's the situation there. Yeah, that's the only thing I can think of. Otherwise, it's I, I got nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she uh, she says, "Oh, you look like you're gonna be sick or something." She says, "I just remembered." There's someone I need to kill. <laughs> I love how gleeful he is about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as I mentioned, folks, uh, Gordon finds a picture that Frank left behind of 
of a young Peter Frank and a young Jim Gordon. Jim Gordon is a boy, and on the back of said picture it says, help me honor his legacy. And then we, I, I love the stinger with the court dragon. I lo- like I said, I love how ominous they are with Frank, where it seems, it seems in this moment with Frank, he's very much in with the court. He's like, everything's going according to plan. It seems like I've at least peaked. You know, I've at least piqued Jim's interest. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, like, is uh, he that good an actor, or is he like just being that good an actor? Right, yeah. right. And I, I really do. I, I really do think the uh, the show's doing a good job with it. And I, I genuinely don't know either way at this point. So props on the show's part for keeping that mystery. Oh yeah. Anyways. So then uh, after that, we have so again Frank's uh, telling uh, Catherine that you know, he needs time, and and she says the clone's in place, and then we have our big ending. Big ending, big reveal. <laughs> yes, we have uh, Bruce. Well, I'm not people are excited about this. Yeah, now Dragon, I I hope this is what I think it is. I'll just say that I know much. it. Is. I I for the fact I know what it is, and Tiki may or may not know. So we're about okay. to find out. Well, uh, I I hope I hope that it's the labyrinth. I I let's just say I I I. I, th- I can see how they can work in the labyrinth, but this, to okay, me, is not okay. an indicator of the labyrinth. I, honestly, though, when you bring that up, though, I, I don't see why they couldn't work in the labyrinth with what they're doing with Bruce's story. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's like Bruce in, cap- in captivity, you know, away from everyone else. Uh, I, I'm hoping for the labyrinth here, Dragon. I Now that you bring it up, I'm hoping they work it into what they're doing, because I know what the main thing they're doing with Bruce's thing. It's the point. Okay. Bruce wakes up in, in snowy, I want to say, Himalayan mountains. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh huh. First, again, he's in the you know he's basically we're doing the thing where we're taking Bruce out of Gotham the train, kind of like the Nightfall thing. Well, yeah, but also kind of like the Batman Begins thing. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, again, it's kind of like and this this to me is kind of a neat way of okay, this this might be a way of squeezing kind of the training of Batman and working it back into Gotham without having him globe trotting. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've had him globe trotting. We don't know how long he's going to be out of Gotham. Right, so, right. We'll see. So, uh. Point is, big ending. Bruce is out of Gotham. We have Doppel Bruce in his place. That's it's, it's a huge reveal. Oh He's in a mysterious Himalayan mountain somewhere. Okay, the promo. Yes. So we had a promo, and then we have the trailer, which I take it you you did not watch. The trailer. I did not watch the trailer. Shit! I wish I knew there was a trailer. Well, but Mary, I told you like the big reveals in the trailer, and then uh, you said you're gonna you're, you're wait till after you watch the episode. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, well, right, here's the promo. Here's, <laughs> well, here's the promo. It's the stuff we can't do. I okay. assume you watched the promo. Yes, I did. I did. Okay, so the we have a, a court table scene, <laughs> and they're wearing all the masks. They're wearing all the masks. <laughs> Do the masks? Yes, yes. Yeah, and I gotta tell you, the the mask uh, they're looking better. I don't know if they changed them at all, but I think they're looking better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know what it was. I think the first time Catherine wore the mask, they did something with her hair. They gave her like kind of one of those kind of poofy judge wigs. I think. <laughs> right, right. I can see that. Yeah. So now I think she looks a lot better. They found like a good base of the mask. Look a lot. Hold the, hold the mask up for a moment. They look closer to this, just that what if the nose was the end of the mask? That's kind of what the idea is with these new masks. It's, it's right, still gets sure, pretty cool looking. Sure. Uh, so let's see. The courts uh, gathered at a table saying, Gotham must fall, which gave me chills. Mm-hmm. Uh, so again, some cool mask shots. Uh, the talons are back. We have another talon, uh, hopefully one of an army of talons. I'm, I'm hoping we get that visual. Uh, we've got a talon attacking Babs and Tab. Oh boy! Oh boy! So basically, a uh, talons info. The point is, the, the talons are attacking the Gotham, the Gotham crime, the underworld. Uh huh. So that's going to be really cool. The towns, the court's making their move in a big way. Uh, there's a weapon of the Corval on route, uh, on route from Indian Hill, which may be the weapon that they had the, uh, you know, they had the uh, the giant crystal owl statue. For. Right. Right. Sure. Uh, again, from Indian Hill, Hugo Strange is doing. Uh, there's a man uh, waiting. Uh, a man who's been waiting for Bruce gives him a hallucinogenic uh, kind of treatment, like a little kind of pinprick in the head. Which, again, kind of, of made me think of the labyrinth a little bit. Maybe, maybe, uh, but uh, gives him a hallucinogenic uh, kind of little thing, the vision quest, uh, which takes him back to Crime Alley. Okay. A place where his parents died. So uh, he says he has so much to teach uh, to teach Bruce. Mm-hmm. So right. that's the Back. crux of what we got going on in the next episode. So we only have uh, two titles to speculate on so far out of the remaining episodes, Track. We only well, have uh, 
Would you like me to tell you what the, the cool stuff we do see in the trailer or, or what? I guess, yeah, sure, really quick. Okay, we got Selena Kyle in a Batman Returns homaging shot. She's like falling through the window shot. Okay. You know, but, you know, Selena, you know in the movie, in Batman Returns, yeah, yeah, when yeah. she falls, you know, she's revived by cats. We're doing that. Uh, we have Ivy, Freeze, and Firefly all gathered around. Ooh, okay. Uh, Barnes is escaping in his kind of a neat looking black suit. Gotta be honest, not really looking forward to that episode. Just we'll kind see. of feels like a dangling plot thread that we need to wrap up just for the sake of wrapping it up. Anyways. I do have news you're really gonna like. Okay. Uh, Hugo Strange is coming back. Thank God, it's been too long. And uh, and Fish Mooney, they're both uh, both returning. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got the Mad Hatter coming back. Looking forward to that. And uh, let's see, all of this is uh, basically, uh, I don't know, I have a big reveal. I'm trying to debate where these are. The point is, all of this, all the stuff that's going on with Bruce Wayne is, uh, the court and Bruce Wayne is kind of to destroy destroy Gotham and out of the ashes a hero will rise. It's kind of the new moniker they're going with. They always love the new monikers for all these little chapters of the story. Like, hey, it's, this one's called Hero Heroes Rise or Hero Will Rise. Mm-hmm. Uh, a protector. Basically, the, Gotham's going to be destroyed and they want Bruce to arise as a protector, as a hero. Sure, sure. I know, okay, that was speculation. So, yeah, episode, so uh, episode 16 is these delicate and dark obsessions and episode 17 is the primal riddle. Ooh. Now, if I'm right, the next episode is directed by Ben McKenzie. Is that, that correct? is correct. That is correct. And that this is his first time directing, and I got word back. Well, I didn't get word back from him directly, but I read <laughs> somewhere that uh, Ben McKenzie, uh, he had a great time directing. He looks forward to doing it more, so he had a nice experience doing it. Nice, nice. And okay, there was a writer uh, cameo. Dragon, I've got a crazy theory about, like, you're you're just gonna laugh in my face about this, and I'm I'm, I'm gonna see because I want to see if you, I want to see if you guess the big reveal. I want to see if maybe you're right on. Oh, this. I don't so think this is the big reveal. This, by all means, don't, don't get your hopes up. Uh, I'm just thinking like with Penguin kind of out of commission, we don't know how long Penguin's gonna be gone, or you know, like how long the storyline with Ivy's gonna last. If Gotham needs a new mayor, I could see. Uh, I hate to even say it, Dragon. I really hate to say it. I could see Barbara potentially vo- jockeying for that position. I could see Barbara jockeying for the position of mayor if the Penguin's out of commission. What do you think? Uh, well... It wouldn't it's... be out of character with what we've seen from her. She's very opportuni- opportunistic. And that's... Well, honest... well, here's yeah. the reason I'm... Uh, part of me wants to say no because she's been in Arkham, but then again, Penguin's been in Arkham, and he was released. So for well, that yeah. reason, I can't, <laughs> I can't discount it for that reason. But secondly, it's well. I mean, I think people would get a sense of okay, let's maybe not let's let's not trust Barbara. But again, why would they trust the Penguin? I mean, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, no, Penguin's I, rallying against Fish Mooney and the monsters. That's kind of that was his big kind of claim to fame. Look, I, I know it's a stretch, but I just think the idea of having Barbara as the mayor of the mayor of Gotham would just be a lot of fun, especially like the irony of all that. And uh, anyways, I wonder, uh, who, I wonder who the acting here's here's the thing con- constantly happens on superhero shows. We always have a lot of mayoral elections, constant mayor elections. Constant. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like, it, like unless unless the Penguin getting revenge on Nigma thing is going to be a one and done thing, and then he just instantly goes back to being mayor. Like, we're going to have that vacuum to fill. I would assume. I'll tell you who I want as mayor, person. I would yeah. like Alfred as mayor. I want Pennyworth for mayor. <laughs> I would totally vote. But no, no. In all seriousness, what would be kind of cool, though, is if uh, the Corps of Owls put someone in the mayor's, mayor's office. That, that would be cool. be cool. That would be cool, like yeah. Catherine yes. as mayor, maybe. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Okay. Catherine or, uh, or maybe Frank. Who knows? Yeah. Um, mm. Let's see. How long do you think uh, – do you think that Gordon's going to be away from the GCPD for the rest of the season off with Frank? You think well, you got to remember to be Tiggy. disconnected a little. Well, I mean, I mean, he's still going to be a member of the GCPD. He's just going to be, you know, he's been doing like a secret. Well, I understand job. that he's still a member. I'm just asking, like, do you think how connected do you think his plot's going to be? Do you think it's mostly going to be this stuff with Frank? Do you think we're going to see him back with Bullock before too well, long? Here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Well, basically, Jim's going to be going undercover, and. Uh, I hope there's going to be. I hope they're going to play this smart. The smart way of doing this is that Jim informs Bullock what he's doing, so he's not going to be no misunderstandings. Uh-huh. No, like, oh, what mess has Jim got himself into this time? I don't want any right. of that. I'm hoping we don't do we don't. And if we do that, I hope we don't do more than one episode of that. 
because we we have seen shots of uh, Jim and Bullock entering a quarter of Al's chamber. So I mean that we've seen that. So that implies at some point Bullock's going to be on board. We don't know when though. Sure, sure. So I just, I just hope they inform us from the beginning, which would be smart. And here's a theory with Gordon. I, I kind of called one of all the theories of when Ben McKenzie said, and this might be what Ben McKenzie was hinting at, uh, you know, he was asked, like, he might be taking on another moniker. He might be taking on, like, the moniker of another character. And this might have been what he was talking about, Court of Elves. Mm -hmm. And I threw out one of the suggestions, of course, when we were that, this back in the day when we thought maybe he could become a proto-Batman. Sure, sure. Uh, I one of the theories I threw out was that maybe Gordon becomes a Talon. So maybe here he has to work his way up from Talon to uh, to court member. That'd be an interesting story arc for him for the rest of the season. Yeah, be interesting. So I mean, we'll uh, we'll okay. see. Uh, um, you got anything else? Uh, shit, I had I, I had something, but I. Oh God, 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 God. Oh yeah. Well, we we already were talking about how. Uh, you know how Ivy, I think, is definitely nursing Penguin back to health because she wants to get in on, you know, she wants to reap the benefits of helping the mayor and get some sort of power out of that. So that's what I think is going on with Ivy. Um, I, I definitely think it's fun that we've got this whole, uh, this epic Riddler and Penguin storyline that's been going on for so long. You know, it's, it's almost kind of grown to Shakespearean levels. And as much as I am kind of like, yeah, they sort of like, you know, they sort of weren't brave enough to go through with killing the penguin. I, I've got to admit, I, as soon as I saw Robin Lord Taylor back and chastising Ivy and whatnot, I'm like, all right, I'm 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 not sad that they made this decision to keep him around. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I knew I knew you were gonna come around on that. <laughs> Uh, let's see, anything else? Uh, I think I've got it. Like, I, I actually wouldn't mind if if Lucius and Bullock were kind of the main uh, buddy cop dynamic instead of Lucius and Gordon, or uh, Bullock and Gordon, I should say. Like, I want to see more of Lucius. Yeah. And I definitely think that Alfred is going to figure out the Doppelbruce thing by next episode. I don't I don't think he's going to be in the dark about that for long. And it was the pie. The pie gave him away. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I, I, I hope that we get uh, Alfred and Selina teaming up to stop Doppelbruce. Maybe, maybe. Okay, and that's well, not so all I got for spec. Let me try to fire through mine. Uh, okay. So let's see. I think uh, I definitely think I'm, I'm gonna. I won't give away who it is, but people, uh, fan, comic fans, I'm sure can pretty much put it together instantly when I say this, so they'll know. But uh, we'll see. Uh, so Doppelbrus is going to be used uh, to destroy Gotham. I'm convinced with the Corvals. The Corvals is going to use him as a pivotal. A thing to kind of get full control over Goth and basically burn it to the ground in some capacity. Uh -huh. uh, the, while the real Bruce is being trained by, and we know the character, we know one of these characters' names, so uh, we know that the the man with the white hair is going to be training Bruce in the next episode. That is uh, Henry Ducard, most likely. Oh, like, oh, okay, okay. Now, TV, let me make it clear. <laughs> okay, let me make it clear. I, I, knew, I, I knew that they were going to this, but yeah, that's right, that's right. We're right on that. Okay, nice. So uh, yeah, they got the white hair. Basically, it's like it's like a ninety percent certainty this guy's is Henry Ducard. Uh -huh. Now let's let for the folks at home. Let, let me remind you: uh, in Batman Begins, the the plot twist in the comics, there the the man who trained Bruce Wayne in the Himalayas is Henry Ducard. That's uh -huh. the character in the comic. And they and they they pulled a wonderful switcheroo in Batman Begins where they mixed the like, <laughs> melted the character. They, even to the point of having like the action figure of Henry Ducard be Brajla Ghoul. <laughs> yeah, so just so you know, that's how it uh, that's how it kind of goes in the comics, and that seems to be what they're doing. Uh huh. I'll be points. I'll be very shocked if it's not Henry Ducard, but it's uh, the point. Is it's going to be a you know a a character like that, the trainer, one of Bruce's trainers uh -huh. from the comics. Um. So by Henry Ducard and uh, and his boss, let's say. I, I yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so, uh, the point is, I think the the real uh, real Bruce Wayne is going to be trained by Henry Ducard and eventually uh, Henry Ducard's boss uh, to <laughs> usher in usher in the new Gotham. That's the protector of the new Gotham. I like it. I like it. I of course I think the Wayne murder was orchestrated and all this to uh, was orchestrated to make this plan happen. And by the season's end, Bruce is going to, having learned this, having kind of experienced this, he's going to be turning that mission, that core mission that's been put into place by the court, the court of Al's core purpose of you know restoring you know, order and balance in the Gotham. Mm -hmm. He's going to take the the good intentions of the court of Al's to formulate his mission to save Gotham. 
<laughs> That'll be the ending of this season. I've been saying that before, but now I think there's more and more evidence to suggest that. Uh, I think Penguin's forming a team of villains because they're just based on the fact that Ivy, Freeze, and, and Firefly are in a shot together. Okay, right, them. right. Basically, I think it's going to be kind of like a long Halloween ending vibe, you know, the end where they're all in the room together. I've not read long Halloween. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, well, the point is like the one the, the cool shower two face and the whole lot of villains like in, a, in I, I mean I'll take your word for it I don't know directly what you're talking about but <laughs> anyway uh, so I think the uh, I think strange is gonna be pivotal in taking the court down okay I like that yeah I, I hope he I hope they give him a meaty role for the season. This, this theory is kind of a weird one, but uh, just because he was said to be in this season, and so far we still have nothing of him, and the fact that with that big old crate that's in the next episode say it's going to be a weapon of the Court of Owls, uh, just the fact that it's Indian Hill, Indian Hill, of course, a lot of weird experimentation stuff, I think it might be Solomon Grundy, because we've had it, you know, the, 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 the giant zombie guy. You know, sure, Solomon sure. Grundy. I, I wouldn't I, be I surprised. Think, yeah, I think that might be him, just given, like, we haven't seen him yet, and they said he was supposed to be in the season. They, they did the same thing with the Mad Hatter last season, though. We were supposed to get yeah, Mad oh Hatter God, in season right, right. two, but we didn't get him until three. So I don't know. Maybe they're saving Grundy for four. Maybe that's like a pattern with the villains. <laughs> and last thing I have is the broad spectrum, how I think the arcs of the season is going to go going forward. I think it's going to be, we're going to start with Court for a couple episodes. Then we're going to go Mooney and Barnes. Uh-huh. Because Mooney's going to come back, and I think that's going to be Penguin's kind of team of villains versus Mooney's just kind of... I don't think Mooney's going to have monsters anymore. I think it's going to be Mooney just kind of trying to take Gotham back now that Penguin's reportedly gone. Sure. And uh, then we're going to go from that to like the last kind of third here, which is going to be the Court of Owls, uh, the Court of Owls and the Big Boss that we've learned. Yeah, I think the Big bo <laughs> the big Revealed Boss is going to be... the. That, it's not just going to be the Court again. It's going to be the Court, but now knowing who the head honcho is. Sure, sure. And uh, then at the very, very end, like kind of the way we end the season, it's probably like a little cliffhanger, like a little post-credits tease at Jerome for next season. At Jerome? Yeah, I just say I think it strikes me that you know, Jerome's like. I don't necessarily you know, like, think they'd end the season on Jerome with all the court of owl stuff, and I don't know. I mean, well, no, I, I don't mean it's going to be like we're going to like. I don't mean a cliffhanger in that sense. I just mean like at the end where we have like like the end of the first season, like the tease of the Bat Cave. I think it's going to be a tease the Batman, which might be Jerome. Okay, okay. Did, I'm just saying the fact that we put him in Arkham and the fact that Jerome's always like a way to get viewers, and if they wanted to ensure a fourth season, they would show Jerome. All right. Okay. That's a theory. Yeah. All right, so final remember, thoughts. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, final thoughts. <laughs> I, nah, I saved you there. I caught you. <laughs> okay, so final thoughts on my end. Uh, Honestly, the only thing that I kind of was let down with the, by this episode, Dragon, is what I agree with you. I think the name thing was a little underwhelming and a little underbaked. But uh, besides that, I thought this episode was a lot of fun. Um, I, the Gordon stuff is a little slow for me so far, so we'll see how that picks up. But other than that, I love, of course, I love the Penguin and uh, Nigma stuff and uh, the, the Doppelbrew stuff. I can already tell is going to be great and... And, of course, Lucius and Bullock were kind of a big highlight of the episode. I hope they have more scenes together. And overall, it's just, you know, it's it's good to be back in spite of the somewhat messy way in which they got us back. You know, I'm having fun with it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the whole, I, uh, you know, I like this one a lot better on the rewatch. I Because, uh, again, some of the Riddler stuff it was a little clunky on the first watch, but, again, it all kind of came into focus and kind of appreciated mm. the cleverness and the, the writing a lot more on the rewatch. Again, I still have issues with a few things I still can't get over, like the name and like the whole book chair catch. <laughs> but right, uh, right. aside from that, again, the the break was really annoying. How we just had to you know wait so long for Gotham to come back because they have other shows they want to get on, and we have you know other networks. You know, uh, it's you know, the fact that you know the, the reason I I believe the reason for this break is they have other shows they want to take the time split slot temporarily. I think mm -hmm. that's what the, you know, these breaks some, sometimes at least breaks that go on this long and sporadically like this. But the point is. Uh, the wait, you know, was it was a little irritating, but again, I think now, especially with uh, the big plot twist they have, which we've, I pretty much given away, but in case anyone has, <laughs> right, right. Yet. But again, just the the big plot twist they have coming, I think they're really finding, they're really working as as hard as they can to get Bruce to the point where he's going to become Batman sooner, and so we're kind of shaping everyone into their destinies, and we're tying it into the core of Owls in a really interesting way. I'm really appreciating. I like, I think what they're doing with this core of Owls stuff is really making the show. Uh, 
feel less of like, uh, hey, we know we're two and we're gonna drag it as long as possible. It feels like, hey, this for this universe, we're really, what if we did a show where we're seeing how Gotham affects people, we're also tying everything in really neatly so the city has even more effect on its characters, which mm. is a smart move. And season three is still turning the last full of a lot of really good surprises so far, except totally. for like Don Felipe here and there. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, on her best behavior this episode. <laughs> yes. I guess with that said, uh, remember, kids, no matter how dark and scary the world may be right now, there will be light. There will be light. Until next time, we'll go exploring Gotham yet again. Oh, God, why are there only, why are there always three answers? Why can't there be four? Come on. Where's the pie? <laughs>